The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Hello, this is Zack Sabre Jr., New Japan Cup winner 2018. And you're listening to Keeping It Strong Style with my mates. Enjoy. Yo, this is Rich Ladder from One Nation Radio. This is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We present to you the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Let's go. It's the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Covering New Japan, they ready to hold it down. Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh. Come and hit a job out in Barrio the Frost. From the Tokyo Dome over to the G1. Social Suplex is the network where we can get it done. I'm a chiller. And let them have it Cause this is just an intro Keeping the strong style Six stars from the get go Boy Yeah from Tampa Bay To the Tokyo Dome This is keeping it strong style With your host Jeremy Donovan And the young boy Joshua Smith And thank you for listening Welcome to keeping it strong style The ace of podcasts On the social suplex podcast network Jeremy Donovan here With the young boy Josh Smith And Tono Lad From Wrestle Talk. On today's show, we'll be discussing New Year's Dash, Jay White, the upcoming New Beginning Tour, answering your questions and covering all his news in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. You can support our show by subscribing to the Social Suplex Podcast Network or to Keeping a Strong Style on the podcast app of your choice and leaving a rating interview. You can also get all the podcasts and columns over at socialsuplex.com. Check out our Pro Wrestling Tees store, prostingtees.com slash social suplex. That's where you can get your official Keeping It Strong style t-shirt. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider making a one-time or monthly donation by visiting socialsuplex.com slash donate. Click on the donate button under the Keeping It Strong style logo. And this week's episode is brought to you by the NJPW EXT, the only browser extension for njpwworld.com with features like dark mode, improved translations and layouts, custom material players, synchronized viewing parties, and much, much more. It takes NJPW World to the next level you can visit njpwext.us today for details. Um, like you heard in the intro, we are joined by Sanal Ladd from Wrestle Talk. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. How are you? We're doing good. Yeah, uh, it's winter time. It's cold out. <laughs> there's no, there's no New Japan on. I don't know. <laughs> it we're, is we're... almost like when there's no New Japan. It's like, what do you do with your time? <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah, we got plenty of New Japan coming up though in, in the coming weeks of the New Beginning tour. But yeah, we're excited to have you on. Like we, we've seen you in the New Japan Reddit with the videos you've been doing on YouTube, and they've been awesome. And definitely another great New Japan content creator. We like to partner with other content creators and get them on the podcast, and you know, just talk about what we love, New Japan. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. I think you see so many for like places like AEW and WWE, and I feel like it's nice to see the New Japan content growing slowly but it is growing and it's great to be on like podcasts like this to speak to people who love the same thing that i do yeah well i mean over the years we've seen a lot of different content creators come and kind of go especially like you know two or three years ago when like the popularity of the product was starting to kind of explode and you know right now it's a little it's a little bit of a more of a lull here in the states but i think with this most recent wrestle kingdom a lot of people's excitement for the product is sort of reinvigorated. But uh, we've been seeing what you've been creating and, you know, what you've been putting out there. And, I mean, you definitely do a really good job. So, you know, we're excited to have you. Thank you. Yeah. It was one of those things that I didn't, like, ever since I was younger, I wanted to do YouTube. But never really had the confidence. And for some reason, like most people during lockdown, I didn't have much to do. And I just thought, right, I'm just going to throw caution to the wind. And New Japan just seemed like it's something that I love. And I thought... Maybe if I can sort of portray some of that to people, then they might be interested in it. And luckily, they have been, and it's been great. That's awesome. So when we have a new guest on the show, we just kind of get a little background on their their history of watching New Japan and their favorite wrestler and their favorite match. Just starting out, how did you start watching uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling? It was really random. So I got into wrestling really late. So I'm 24 now, and I think I got into it when I was about 18. And I started watching WWE like most people do. Um, but what it is, is I know someone from high school. And when I started talking to them about how I liked wrestling, they and it was also t- around the time of the Cruiserweight Classic, they were like, if you liked that sort of stuff, you've seen Zack Sabre Jr. Make sure you watch more British stuff with like Will Ospreay and things like that. And Marty Scurll. And obviously, 
that was sort of, I think, about 20... Hard. Do you remember? It was before um, Wrestle Kingdom in 2018. And basically there, in, during that, was a fatal four-way for the IWGP Junior Championship with Osprey and Mighty Scroll. Right. And so I watched that, loved it, like saw the match with Kenny and Jericho, and it sort of just snowballed from there. It was, I think it was the New Beginnings tour where I actually like properly sat down, watched it, and got into it. So, yeah, it was pretty late, and I'm a bit sad in that sense that I didn't find it earlier, but better now than way way in the future so. <laughs> well, well the good news is there's an entire archive on new japan world that you can always go through <laughs> right <laughs> it's one of the things that i love doing like if you find especially in the early days when i found a wrestler i liked and my favorite thing to do was literally type their name in on new japan world and go to the first page to so the farthest away possible and see their first match on the archives and i think like i always recommend that to people who want to start new japan because it's just so much fun seeing them, like, just when they started out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, with that being said, what is your, who is your favorite New Japan wrestler? Uh, I think most of my followers probably know how vocal I am. It's Jay White. It's <laughs> obviously quite funny considering what we're talking about today. But, yeah, um, it'll probably tie into, like, something, like, late if I talk about it. But the first, like, major feud I saw in New Japan that I was invested in was Jay White versus David Finlay. Mm. And that was the new, like, just in the New Beginning tour, they had their first match. Right. And then after that, obviously, in Don Taku, they had their big feud. And for some reason, there was something about Jay's character. Like, obviously, he had his first Wrestle Kingdom show, and he brought this amazing, like, VT and the Titan Tron and things that he used. And there's something about his character and, like, the way he wrestled that I was obsessed with. And even now, like, Three years later, I've met him like a few times, and I, he's still my favorite wrestler like, every way. That's awesome. Yeah, we've been big Jay White fans here pretty much since day one and kind of have gone to bat for Jay because I know a lot of Western fans in particular have kind of been down on like the, the cheating shenanigans and just kind mm-hmm. of his character and what he does. But at the end of the day, he's, just, he's a phenomenal pro wrestler. Yeah, I remember during the Kenny feud, like, so that was, like, literally New Beginning right after the, his debut. And mm-hmm. we were listening to the promos, and I was like, I think they got something with, with Jay White. I mean, we'd already seen him um, on his excursion and as a young line, but, you know, you never know how it's going to work out when they return. But people were so, I mean, for the first six to eight months, so down on him. And I feel like we were really, really ahead because we were like, He's kind of like really good. I think he's gonna be a big, a big star. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I think that's the funny thing because people have been messaging me, obviously asking about like, the news we're gonna talk about about Jay's status. And I tweet something about obviously after the New Year's Dash show and Tomohiro she did like a promo backstage, which seemed to be quite like mm-hmm. sort of empathetic towards Jay. And I always say this, and people don't understand. Chaos Jay White era. So that was the first few like eight months after his like came back from excursion. That was my favorite Jay White, and I know mm. people just don't agree with me, <laughs> yeah. but I they're like, how can you think that? <laughs> but that was my favorite Jay White. Mm. Can't can't go wrong with that. That's an interesting take. See, for <laughs> me, I I feel like he's never changed. Like I feel like he's. I mean, when he went Bull Club, I feel like he embraced his. Uh, shitbag heelness a little bit more but like i've always seen him the same i always saw him as like this odd thumb like in the middle of chaos and he he didn't make a secret about it like from day one he was like okada this is a business transaction i'm not like yeah. your boy i'm not one of- <laughs> one day we're gonna fight like so he kind of knew let us at, like he let everybody know what's up from day one you know yeah and I almost think, like, if you look at what Chaos was formed on, I think if we maybe went back to, like, Shinsuke Nakamura Chaos when it was formed, Jay would have been the perfect fit, and he probably would have stayed there. Because, I mean, I almost think, like, you're right, Jay White hasn't really changed much. Like, his style's not changed much, his character. It's just maybe with the Bullet Club logo on him, people see him differently, thinking, yeah. oh, now he's a proper heel. Whereas I think he's always been a heel, he's even always in been chaos. Heel. Yeah, from day one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, I think we definitely have the right person on to talk about <laughs> this week's episode. Um, what is your favorite New Japan match of all time? Ah, uh, that's hard because after Wrestle Kingdom, it was definitely Jay versus Ibushi. <laughs> oh, nice. But um, if I'm not going to say that one because that's literally like very recent, 
it was probably and really again another match stemming from like when I started. It was the Don Taku match, Jay White versus David Finley. Very because, interesting. Yeah, it's like, it's one of those matches that stick in my head, not just because it was like one of the first ones I properly watched, but it's that whole storyline. They were young lions, they were best friends. Then Finley obviously stayed in the dojo, Jay went on excursion, and suddenly he came back and like these two former best friends are now at loggerheads with two completely different ideologies. Like it was a match that had amazing wrestling with two guys who were so different in styles, but also just had really good storytelling from like even the smallest bits of it. So I think like it's such an underrated rivalry and that match is also really underrated. And yet apart from the Ibushi versus Jay at Wrestle Kingdom, it has to be that one. Guys. Yeah, Absolutely. the Jay and Finley, that was a kind of a great feud, kind of a great beginner feud for him, too, uh, just with their history and everything. So, yeah, they definitely had a, a series of uh, very good matches. I feel like around that time period, people slept on that match. They also kind of slept on the Hangman match. Yeah, the match he had with Hangman Page. In, Which was uh, really good. One of the California shows. Yeah. That was also amazing. I think because, once again, it's sort of like the battle of styles and the battle of ideologies. Like, Hangman is the mix between strength and he's sort of not a high flyer, but very agile. Whereas Jay's always been more of a mat based guy, especially after returning from excursion. And yeah, I just like the whole, the whole lead up to that match, like the press conference and things were all amazing. Yeah, that's great. So let's get a uh, dive into what we're going to talk about today. Well, first, uh, one of our listeners in uh, Japan, Reddit user PCN91, kind of gave us a little feel report. Trying to get uh, his shit in. <laughs> Trying to get his shit in on our show. Uh, gave us some info on his um, experience at Wrestle Kingdom Night 1. Just wanted to give us some notes. So he said, uh, first thing of note was that they weren't allowed to bring in any alcohol, and no alcohol was sold in the venue. He said, luckily, he stuck a couple cans in the bottom of his bag. Uh, he found this measure strange as shows uh, he's been to in Osaka. They never checked the, your bag. I guess that the lack of liquid fuel could explain the more subdued crowd during some of the matches, anything before the semi-main and main event. Uh, secondly, he says, the overall layout was really well done as, for, as far as where we were sitting on the 1F stand. The arena seats looked packed as they normally would for a Tokyo Dome show. Also props to the stage and set design as that looked incredible, and my photos came out looking fantastic this year. Lastly, I think the live stream didn't fully capture the crowd noise on night one as the crowd around me were marking out during the semi-main and main event. Even some people shouted things out loud as mm. they shouldn't control the, couldn't control their emotions. Also, I heard reports from two of my friends who were sitting on the arena floor of Salty Naito fans leaving after the three count <laughs> and openly booing the finish of the match. Luckily, I was in a pocket of Ibushi fans who, like, like myself, stayed until the end and were treated with one of the moments of the weekend, which was Naito handing the titles over to Ibushi. So he says his question related to this last point, what do you think of salty fans who leave right after their favorite loses? I compare it to the same people who leave in the 90th minute of a soccer game despite the face. There may still be some time to get a last-minute winner. Very interesting. I think the first thing um, with the alcohol, I would just assume they, they didn't want any food or drinks because of mask restrictions, right? Or am I wrong? Probably, yeah. Make sure to ensure people keeping their mask on the whole time. Yeah, but how do we feel? Do you guys do you guys not like when people get up and leave when they're favorite? You know, what, what's your thoughts? I don't know. I think it's a hard one, especially with wrestling. Like, I feel like if you leave, you're gonna miss something. Like, if you think about last year, if maybe Okada fans would have left before the end, then they wouldn't have seen Kenta attacking Naito. It's one of those things. I think in wrestling. You're going to miss something. The ending is one of the best bits. And imagine walking out and missing that moment Naito handed Ibushi the belts. Like, I think it was one of the most iconic things. And also, great storytelling in the relationship between those two. So, I just think if you're going to pay for the show, just watch it all. Like, it's <laughs> right. wrestling. Just go and enjoy it. Especially if you're at the, the end of the main event. Like, you've literally been there three, four, five hours, like, yeah, your guy didn't win, but just go ahead, stick it out. But again, that just shows you how emotionally invested some people are into New Japan and their favorites. That like they they literally ride or die with their favorites, and their favorite doesn't win, and it's it's a big emotional loss. Yeah, you kind of stole it from me, Jeremy. That was gonna be my hot take. <laughs> I'm all about this all day long. If if the marks want to get marked, like get worked. I'm all fucking for it because how often is it that everybody thinks that they're so smart and they know everything that's going to happen and they're apathetic and, you know, all the cheers are just manufactured and it's fake, you know, enthusiasm because 
the crowd wants to be a part of the show and get themselves over, which there's a time and place for that. But it's pretty awesome when, like, the fans are so invested in the actual outcome that they get enraged and fucking leave. Like, You're right. <laughs> I love that. I, I think we need to see more of that. I mean, I get it. I think I get it if, for example, like, it was Jay White winning or Kenta, but it's nice. Like, I feel like it's not really doing anything to have people leaving for Naito because he's not a heel. But, for example, like, if Kenta won the bloody main event, like, <laughs> yeah, walk out. If he beats Ibushi, that's fine. But I just find it weird someone for Naito because he's such a loved guy, especially in Japan. Well, that's the thing. They loved him so much that they thought he was going back-to-back both nights. And to see him get knocked out night one, which means he's for sure not coming back the second night, if, if that's your guy, you're going to be pissed. Right. You know? Just like... Bro, I would have lost my mind if Hibushi got knocked out night one. <laughs> I, I, and I really would have. So I, I, I get this. Yeah, I think it's just like when um when Okada first debuted the pants, and I I hated it. <laughs> I hated it so much that I wanted to turn off the TV. So I I understand this feeling. So I understand that you're probably the um, short pants pop. Oh, when he rips his scale. When he ripped those that freaking dress off the first time at Wrestle Kingdom against Jay White, I ran all around this place. I free, I almost like knocked over the TV. Like it's yeah, he did. Is it, is it weird that like out of the fact that there was absolutely no cheers, it's the short pants pop that I've been missing? Because that yeah. was that was a moment every single time that the pants kept like the skirt came off, there was a chair. Yeah, well, that, he's, still, shows. he's still working them. He's like waiting for it. And he's like, <laughs> Let's go. Like, he's not yeah. going to take his pants off until they you know, clap for Until something. they clap for yeah. it. And that just shows you how talented Okada is that he was able to get over taking off his entrance gear to, <laughs> to reveal that he's wearing, you know, shorts again. So, yeah. So, and, yeah. I mean, he's gone through so many things. He went long pants, then shorts, then trunks, and now he's back onto shorts again. He really needs to make his mind up. That's my <laughs> thing. <laughs> Well, uh, now we're going to talk about uh, New Year's Dash, and got a question here to open up our discussion about New Year's Dash. Uh, it comes from Reddit user The Peaky Blinder. So, do you think there is now too much expectation on New Year's Dash to have a shock slash surprise angle debut, as in AJ getting super kicked out of Bullet Club, much like the Raw after Mania, is expected to have something of note to happen? Nope. <laughs> nope. I I disagree one hundred percent. Is it? too much expectation to think that when they do the reset show that they're going to have new angles and new surprises and fun matches and debuts and everything absolutely not i think that's exactly what we expect out of the show because they gave it to us for so many years it's only like the last two years where it's like started to kind of dwindle down and this year was the 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 year that was lacking in those types of things more more so than ever yeah, I was going to say, like, last year, the highlight and, like, the big thing was Liger's retirement. Mm-hmm. This year, it did sort of just feel like you were expecting, like, especially with this whole Jay White thing, we were expecting something from it. And, I mean, personally, like, it didn't impact me that much. Like, for me, any New Japan show is great, and I don't expect it. But, yeah, there was sort of that feeling at the end of the show, like, some like I didn't want to switch off. I was like, something's going to happen, isn't it? Like... Is Jay going like, to have another tantrum? Is he going to have a Zack Sabre Jr.-esque breakdown? But, yeah, it just ended. I was like, ah, oh, just, I wanted just something. Something. That's yeah. it. She yeah. said just it. Something. Yeah. Just something. Just something. Just something. Like you said, like, overall, I thought it was a fine show from top to bottom. You know, the guys worked hard, had some good matches. They did set up a lot of title challenges, which we're going to talk about on the New Beginning Tour but yeah, there wasn't that that one thing that you remember. Normally, like you mentioned, like last year there was Liger. You think about AJ getting kicked out of Bullet Club. You think of Jay White um, joining Chaos and and not joining Bullet Club. And so there's always at least like this one kind of thing that you remember, one kind of hot angle that really kind of kicks off the year. And you know maybe because of the COVID restrictions and maybe not a hundred percent certain of what their future yeah. was going to look like. Maybe they're like. Let's just set up some tile challenges and hope that we can run in the future. Maybe that's why they didn't go some hot angles. Um, but, yeah, I definitely would have liked something to be memorable. I mean, we did have one angle we'll talk about with the with the Empire. Uh, but I definitely feel like the, with the, how hot the JY conversation was after night two of the Tokyo Dome, I definitely felt like they could have gave us a little bit more there in that area. I mean, I think that's sort of been the running thing. I know people have been like, shitting on new japan for the past year but covid has made a massive issue yeah it has caused so many changes like how do we know that if 
there was no pandemic. Evo might not have been in Bullet Club. Like, we don't know. Evo might not have taken the titles. Anything could have happened. And it'll be the same this year. You can plan stuff. And what if it doesn't happen? Like, they built up last year Naito versus Hiromu, and it couldn't happen. I think they're just trying to probably be safe. I, I know how you're wrong, because Chris Jericho told us so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if Chris Jericho says it, then then it's for it's sure. True. Yeah, then it has to be true. Yeah, <laughs> how could you even dare to question him on this airwave? Oh my god! <laughs> no, but um, I agree. I I definitely think that you know COVID played uh you know a hand in this role, and it's like you know New Japan's one of the most conservative companies that's out there. They're not one to take risks, you know, unwantingly. And so it makes a lot of sense why they might have been a little bit more conservative. But my here's one of my biggest uh, complaints about it was like every single one of these matches that happened here could have easily happened on any road to show. I mean, road to Dantaku, just New Japan Road, period, just road. Right. But what I like about you know, New Year's Dash is when we get like, and I know he wasn't there, but like, just to give you an example, I like when Cheeseburger was in the six man tag against <laughs> Kenny. And I liked when like freaking Kitamura wrestled Jay White. Jay White. And I like yeah. when we get like Bullet Club against, you know, Team 2000, weird shit like that. Like, give us something at least wacky. Like, they gave us Nagata and Gabe Kid. I'm sure I've seen that match <laughs> plenty of times. As much as I liked it, like, I'm going to see it again down the road. Like, it, that's not a New Year's Dash match to me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think maybe, like, even something, if anyone watched the Rambo, like, give us Nagata versus Suzuki. <laughs> oh, my God, yes. <laughs> Throw something in like that way. It's just, like, 15 minutes of two old men just hitting each other. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's go over this New Year's Dash card. We'll just kind of go over some of the results quickly and then talk about some of the major talking points, and there's some questions, too, so... Like Josh mentioned, New Year's Dash, we opened up, we had Yuji Nagata defeating Gabriel Kidd, so kind of the standard Nagata versus Young Lion matchup there. Not standard, because Gabe Kidd has new socks. They're not the black <laughs> socks. They're, they're white with red and black trim. It's nice. You know, I, I feel like I've never met someone like you, like, who's like me, who notices those. It's like when you see, like, Ren Narita used to have, like, the black socks with the white stripes. Yeah. Sometimes I think I can't remember which LA Young Lion had like colored stripes. So I was like, oh, I think, I think it was Clark Connors. Clark Connors. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, this is great. This is a massive day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then next we had the Suzuki Gun team of Doki and Minoru Suzuki defeating Tiger Mask and Yuya Mora. Uh, Doki and Suzuki, my new favorite uh, Suzuki Goon tag team. <laughs> yep. I'm I mean, all about I don't know, team Are Doki. they going to do World Tag League or um, the best of the Super Junior Tag League? <laughs> yeah, I think if we can get Doki, you know, put some pounds on, we can get him and Suzuki in the, in the World Tag League. I think they're both on the on like the cusp to where like I think Suzuki could probably cut down to Junior, and I think Doki could probably pack on some pounds in time for World Tag League. They can do both, bro. What if they <laughs> yeah. want? What if they won both in the same year, making <laughs> history? That'd be amazing. <laughs> Uh, the next matchup, we had the Empire, Great Khan, Jeff Cobb, and Will Ospreay, accompanied with B. Priestley, defeating uh, Tenkoji and Yota Suji. So here's where we had our uh, pretty much our main angle of this show. So after the Empire gets the win here, they attack um, Tenkoji. They they lay out Tenzon, and we, we got a stretcher job. They have to stretcher out uh, Tenzon out of the building. Got a got a heated promo. They declare themselves now the United. Empire and pretty much, you know, that you, they, Will was saying, you know, you thought we're, we're soft because of what happened at Wrestle Kingdom, um, but we're going to show you, you know, now we're united and, you know, 2021 is going to be our year. So, overall, what are your guys' thoughts on this angle here? I'm going to first say that my heart was breaking <laughs> as Tenzan was lying. I thought it was so cute how Kojima was getting beaten up and Tenzan went out there to save his tag partner. <laughs> but, I mean, I think it was needed after the, like, all three members of the Empire losing, they needed something like that. And as we'll talk about later with the New Beginning, so it set up a really nice storyline that, like, I didn't expect, but now I really want to see. And also there was, like, that point where I'm like, wait, is this actually a work or is, like, Tenzan seriously <laughs> injured? Yeah, I think it's easy to believe that Tenzan would be stretchered out because he's been, like, halfway ready for a stretcher job anyway. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, in this moment, Will uh, Will Osprey definitely got some heat with me with the the hidden blade <laughs> to uh, my man Kojima. 
That, that was uncalled for. That was disrespectful to the strongest arm. And yeah. I mean, How long are you going to work this gimmick, brother? What, what gimmick? I, I love Kojima. I'm a member of it Bread was, Club. It was also disrespectful to Bread Club. As a member of Bread Club, I found it disgraceful when we lost a, a fellow countryman of mine damaging the leader of Bread Club. It hurt to <laughs> um, I thought it was funny. Um, you know, just a week ago, we saw so many hot takes on the message boards and on Twitter and on Reddit and Facebook and yada yada. And, oh, this United Empire group is a bunch of geeks. They all lost. What is New Japan doing? And I'm just like sitting here like, do you guys, have you guys never watched New Japan ever <laughs> in your entire life? Mm -hmm. Do you not know that they're going to heat these guys up the very next night and that like this makes total storyline sense? Now, yes, granted, we were you know, predicting ahead of time that one or some of these, you know, uh, United Empire members were going to win at Wrestle Kingdom. But when they didn't, it made total sense. I'm like, this is Gato booking 101. So, you know, we came on the air last week and said, they're going to heat these guys up. People fail up in New Japan all the time. And that's exactly what they did here. And people were like, a young lion and some dads. Oh, my gosh, that doesn't inspire <laughs> much. And it's like... No, I think that's a big thing. Like when I was looking at the card for Wrestle Kingdom to start with, and everyone was like, "Well, what's the point of Tanahashi versus Okan? Like, they're not going to have Tanahashi lose, but what's the point for Okan?" I'm thinking, did you not watch like three years ago? Jay White lost to Tanahashi. Look at him now. Like, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly yeah, the, that's the something point. We said. Yeah, that's because a lot of fans are, are down on Okan, and we we're we're big on Okan. We watched Okan mm -hmm. since he was you know young line as Oka, and yeah. That's the exact, you know, some comparisons we made. Like, look what happened to Jay White. Like, people didn't love that match with Tanahashi. And then look where he's at now. He just main evented, you know, night two of the dome for the double titles. And, you know, I'm not saying that Okan is going to get to that level, but that's kind of on the same trajectory that they see him. They see things in him, and they're going to try to get him to that level. I I'm saying he's going to get to that level for mm -hmm. sure. Like, yeah. for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like, you know... N not to disrespect, you know, your favorite wrestler, Jay White, but, like, I liked Oak Oka as a young lion much more than I liked Jay White as a lion. I think he has all the potential in the world to be on that same level. And I, I think the, the company is going to push him to go to the – they're going to use him as a big four, big five guy in, what, three years probably, two years from now? He's right. going to be on that level. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's fresh, you know, new blood – it's, you know, shaking things up, getting some new people in the mix. You know, a lot of people complain about having the same matchups all the time. Well, you, you, you got to introduce new people in order to shake things up and to get some fresh matchups, fresh storylines, fresh fresh feuds. Um, so, yeah, the uh, I'm all in on Great Ocon. I like what's going on here with the United Empire making a statement here by taking out um, Tenzon, kind of setting up the stories that we're going to see on this New Beginning tour. And, and it, it also makes sense why this was... Well, for two reasons. Number one, like you mentioned, Sonal, they definitely have a, a nice little story for what Will Ospreay and the rest of the group going into New Beginning. But even if they hadn't necessarily had, because, again, things were in question with the state of emergency, you know, right on the horizon, do you set up a huge long-term blood feud for Will and, like, let's say, quote-unquote Naito? You know what I mean? Do, mm -hmm. do, do you waste that sort of big-money match for... You know, a tour that maybe isn't going to happen. If it is, maybe it's going to be em empty arena. Or if it is, maybe it's going to be capped at 5K. Mm -hmm. Or do you put him into a feud with Kojima, who's a guy that, that was just in a big prominent spot at Wrestle Kingdom, who looked good and is an easy, you know, gimme win, and it's going to be a building block for going into, like, you know, New Japan Cup. Like, this this is exactly the kind of booking that they do, and it, it just makes all the sense in the world. But, you know, I think people live in a world of, like, instant gratification or, you know, they think it's weekly episodic TV and, like, that's not what this company is. Right. And when you look at the tour that's coming up, like, it's it, it was set up perfectly for what they wanted to do. And I always think, like, as a Kojima fan, it's just nice to see Kojima in, like, back-to-back -back quite big yeah, Yes. Like, a amen. Yes. I'm loving it. Yeah, I've been loving it. Over the last few years, we've seen him in, like, Wrestle Kingdom, like, in the Neverman or, like, not even on the card. And the fact that this has happened, I'm just so happy. Like, seeing Kojima in, like, prominent spots, I'm like, yes, New Japan, give us, give us <laughs> the third-generation crew right on main eventing it. 
every event if they want. I will happily take that. <laughs> yeah, seeing him take these two big, big prominent losses back to back is gonna be awesome. Hey, hey, calm, <laughs> calm down there. No, I'm just joking. Hey, this, is, this is when Kojima like actually wins, and you're like. <laughs> oh, if, if Kojima beats Will Ospreay, I'll, I'll genuinely be shocked. Like, yeah, that'll be. <laughs> but remember, like you know, usually they do go with Kojima for Fantastic Mania. You mm -hmm. know, they, yeah, they that's put true. Him, they put him in like he always has a feud. Yeah, he always has a feud at, at Fantastic Mania. So like, this is his time to shine. Right. He's <laughs> like, I don't care that you know <laughs> the letters might not say CMLL, <laughs> but I'm still here. <laughs> oh, oh, Tari Blake can't make it. <laughs> Oh, Roosh can't come? All right, Will Ospreay, why don't you step on up? <laughs> uh, so we have some questions here about the United Empire. Uh, first from Reddit user uh, Veer Sabian asked, any predictions on who will either defect or be brought in as a potential junior for the United Empire? You know what? I've seen people say Robbie Eagles. I personally don't think so, but it would be interesting to see Robbie because we've seen him as a heel in Bullet Club. And I think me saying that, that's the only reason I'm thinking it won't be Robbie because I don't think Robbie's good as a heel. I would like to see, I don't know, like, his status with New Japan at the moment, but Yu Lee, you know, formerly Dragon Leaf in CMLL. Mm -hmm. Someone like him or, you know, I'm thinking, and this is sort of like a weird long-term booking, but Ishimori, just because of the fact that El Phantasma is coming to Bullet Club. And I've said, El Phantasma likes the spotlight. And I think there's going to come a time where Ishimori's going to get sick of it. <laughs> so I'd love to see Ishimori go and sort of be able to shine in a new faction that's not overcome by so many huge personalities like Bullet Club is. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with you on, on Robbie Eagles. I, I think he works better as a babyface, and I, I would not want to see him back in the heel role so quickly into the Empire um, I think another name kind of throw out there is either show or yo. Um, there's a no, lot we of can't <laughs> we can't. as like probably the world's biggest Rapongi 3K fan. We can't have that because that will involve <clears throat> Rapongi 3K splitting up, and I can't I can't be dealing with the heartache. I that. mean, I I think they split up at the New Japan Cup this past year when uh, when Yo got hurt. I think they're done. I don't think we're ever going to see him again. But yeah, I could be wrong. That hurt my heart when, like, they like this new statement came out, like, Yo's injured for the next year. I was like, oh. and, then so, and then when someone said, Show might be going to the like empire, I was like, No, no, that well, you can't know, happen. we've always joked about like Yo being like Seth Rollins, yeah, <laughs> and he's out and he's coming back, he's gonna rebuild. What was it like the slogan? Re rebuild, re re reclaim or something. Yeah, yeah reclaim, redesign <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> um, you, I got a little hot take here. I think that. There definitely could be a junior that's on the horizon, but like, I don't see any particular reason that it needs to be anything that happens anytime soon. You know, I'm totally fine with them having a little three man unit. I mean, if you recall, Lij was just Bushi and Evil and you know Naito for you know quite a while until Sonata came in during the G1. Like, there's not necessarily uh, an immediate need for them to have a top junior to challenge. The one thing I will say is when they institute that person, it probably needs to be somebody that's going to take the title very quickly. So I'm imagining mm -hmm. somebody that beats Hiromu and like steps into some sort of major, you know, uh, situation. One name I don't think you guys mentioned, and I agree with most of the names so far. And that's the thing. I think it's interchangeable. They could do whatever they <laughs> want at this point. They have a lot of creative freedom, but Leo Rush is a name that no one's thrown mm. out there, and I think that he could potentially fit into that role once some of these travel restrictions are lifted. Yeah, he would fit in perfectly. I think, I think my issue, like you were saying, Lij with the three man. I think three men would be perfect because we have the issue where you keep adding members and you get to a bullet club stage where there's just too many of them. Right. So I think, yeah. While there's no need, so while there's no best of Super Junior being announced yet or any sort of junior tournament, I don't think you need that many, especially because you've got B Priestley as well. Like you don't want to oversaturate a faction so early. Right, and so, because it's so new, you really want to focus on getting these guys over, right. especially Great Ocon. you got to establish mm -hmm. him. You gotta establish Jeff Cobb in this new heel role. You gotta establish Will Ospreay in this new heel role. There's a lot of new characters to establish here, and so you don't want to keep just throwing new people into the faction and having to have to spend so much time establishing so many different other people. Like the one 
argument against that that I could see is like maybe like say the inner circle in AEW. They did a really good job instituting five guys that really kind of didn't belong together. And they kind of did it very quickly. Right. But that's pretty rare, you know, and <laughs> especially with the way that New Japan books, I think that it, it would be better for any other additional members they bring in that it happened organically after they've kind of established the <laughs> squad. And it's like, you don't want to just artificially, you know, attach somebody just because it's like, oh, we need a tag team. We need a junior. We need a heavyweight. We need a mid card guy. No, you don't need all that. Like, right. Let, let, like, let's see how this plays out first. I think that's a problem. Once you start thinking like that, if you'll get a junior and then you'll go, oh, we need another junior for junior tag teams. Then you're like, oh, well, we need one more heavyweight because maybe we need, like, the tag team for heavyweight. Oh, let's just put one more for the never three-man. And then you just end up with so many members just for the sake of, like, going for titles. Right, yeah. Uh, so the next question we had here is from uh, Kevin from D.C. He says, last week there was a serious consideration that the Empire would go three for three in their singles matches to firmly establish themselves as a faction to recognize. So, of course, they go 0 for three. And even though they were <laughs> positive they take from it, in each match, including the Ocon match, I'm a little disappointed that this is the route that they went with. What does the Empire need to do out of the gate to reestablish themselves in 2021? They need a stretcher. Uh, <laughs> it <depends on. laughs> I was going to say, I think they've already done it by beating down one of the dads of New Japan. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that uh, that decision, although it makes sense to me, is something that might be like not that impressive to a lot of people watching like oh they beat down the dads and and, and, a, and a you know and a lion okay what what next well it's like well we're gonna see it play out you know right and i think you know people are under, underestimating the popularity of a guy like tenzon um he is beloved by the fans he you know he had a lot of, he has a lot of history there one of the kind of the stars during that dark ages and you know he means a lot to those fans so to maybe to the western fans or maybe people who don't Tune in on every road to show or, you know, tune into the dad's matches. It might not seem like a big deal, but Tenzon is still, you know, a top guy there, top, you know, beloved figure. And so, the, you know, taking him out the way they did. And like I mentioned to somebody, like, you know, they, they don't do stretcher jobs often in New Japan. Um, so it was, it's kind of a, you know, they do it very rarely. So that was another kind of thing to make you be like, oh, man, like Tenzon is really hurt here. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering if he's done. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he's on the ne- on the. New beginning tour, oh. so he's, he's. Well, I know I can say that when the Empire beat down Tenzan, like I, they got heat from me. Like I was, I was fuming. I was like, "Yeah, I hate <laughs> you guys are awful. Like you're the biggest heels ever, beating up Tenzan." Especially because everything. I don't know if you guys saw, but during the Wrestle Kingdom, so night one he was um, seconding Kojima, and he got knocked into the guardrail. Then he was with Water when he got knocked in, he got knocked down. So I feel like, you know what, New Japan just aren't giving Tenzan a break. And this was like the icing on the cake. They were like, you know what, have the Empire beat him down even more. That'll get him heat. I don't remember Tenzan getting beat up on those nights. I just remember my man getting paid, getting multiple appearances. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think as far as like establishing themselves... I mean, what's the best way to establish yourself in New Japan? It's winning feuds, winning matches, and sure, they they lost in their initial outing as a group on the big stage, but I mean, I don't know. You know, uh, I think that Cobb and uh, Okan did very, very well for themselves in the World Tag League. Mm -hmm. That's got to count for something, and I Mm -hmm. think that on these next few, uh, you know, tours, they're going to do very well, and I think it's going to be a while before we see... Will Ospreay eat another big loss like this? Like, right now, I I think I'd be, feel pretty safe to say he might even be, like, my pick for New Japan Cup, possibly. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good choice. You know? So, yeah, I, I don't know. I think the thing is that if he was going to take a loss, like you said, he's not going to take a big loss for a while. It should be against Okada. Like, if you think about it, Ospreay has not been a heavyweight for that long, and you're putting him against Okada, who's main event in God knows how many Wrestle Kingdoms. Like... When Osprey lost, people shouldn't have been that surprised. Like, it's not a huge thing in the grand scheme of things. It's not like Osprey lost to, like, I'm trying to think, like, Master Wato. I love Master <laughs> Wato. <laughs> that one. I love him. He's my guy. I followed him since he was a young man. But do you know what I mean? Like, Okada's a big established star, like, one of the biggest in the world. It's not a massive deal for someone like Osprey to lose to him. Right. I think the story that they told in that match we talked about last week, the story was Osprey cannot beat. Okada clean by himself and he tried to 
he cheated to beat him in G1. That was the first time he beat him. Um, and so at Wrestle Kingdom, you know, he tried to beat him clean. He wanted to beat him on his own merit, and he failed. So there's, there's still the story of Osprey seeking to beat Okada. It's a long term story that's going to eventually. Osprey is going to beat Okada clean at some point, and it's going to be a big deal. I hope he never does. <laughs> uh, Greg da- Greg asked us. He said, uh, "Where do you think Empire is going, and do you see anyone else joining?" I think we've touched on some of this, but one point I'd like to make: I feel that this is going to be the year of the United Empire, even more so than say any of the other groups that are in in the company right now, and. I think this is going to be the first year where we're going to be able to say that a group other than LIJ is really in contention for being like the faction of the year in New Japan. That's mm-hmm. where I see this group going. And I almost think that is what sort of what we touched upon earlier, the size. LIJ is so successful because they're small, close knit, and I think the Empire have that. With the three of them, they're just going to get better teaming together. They're going to have like LIJ like teaming skills. And that is always going to help you win titles and also maybe not win the love of the fans, but sort of have fans go, you know what? This is a really mega badass faction. I yeah. agree. Yeah, I think, yeah, this is going to be their year. I think we're going to see them get pushed to the top. And I think it's going to be a gradual build. I know people probably want them to go out the gate and win all the titles, but I think they're going to start off a new beginning. Pick up some wins here. They're going to go in a new Japan Cup, get some wins there. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you're going to get to, we're going to get to G1 season and these guys are going to be probably red hot going into their blocks and are probably going to be favorites to get a lot of points. The funny I, thing is, I think for the G1 is, with three of them, and because they're such a new faction, are they going to leave out one of the members and just have one guy in each block? It's going to be tough to say because um, we already saw how stacked this last year's G1 was and um, kind of instituting another guy in uh, what's wrong with me? Who's the new Ocon? Oh my god! Um, it, you have to ask yourself, well, who's the odd man out when it comes to G one this year? You know, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the question we ask every year. So it, that will be tough to you know to say right now. I think it will depend on what the availability of you know the stars are by the time you know we get there, which will be like what like September, October, right? And you know, yeah. we got to think about travel restrictions as well. We don't know what things are going to look like come G one time, and you know. New Japan before COVID, they were bringing in guys like John Moxley and Kenta and all these new guys into the promotion. So, I'm not worried. Sugabayashi and Kidani, they got that deep money. They're gonna get those. Uh, <laughs> they're gonna get those vaccines, those mRNAs going. Yeah. Wow. So I mean, there could be new guys that are you know getting released from WWE or guys that we know there are guys in AEW that that have the clause that they can work both promotions. They might some of those guys might come in for G one, so it's gonna be really interesting just to see like how stacked G one could possibly be this year. No, nobody from AEW wants to be in the G one, bro. <laughs> like, like Mox did it once, and I, he's like never again. He's never gonna do another G one. It's like the hardest tournament. <laughs> That's the thing. I think people underestimate. It. Like, they come in like, oh, I want to be part of the G one so much, and there's so many guys have done it, and they're like, oh. Um, well, that that was that's a lot harder than I expected. I, didn't, I thought it was gonna be a few ten minute matches, like match against Yano, and then they're going like three three days in a row, like like twenty minute matches. And they're like, ah, like my body is aching now. Flair did it in like ninety five when it was like two or three days, and he was like, man, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So uh, moving on. In New Year's Dash, we had a Bullet Club matchup with El Phantasmo, Taiji Ishimori, Tamatonga, and Tangaloa defeating the Suzuki Gun team of El Desperado, Taichi, Yoshinobu Kanemaru, and Zack Saber Jr. So, kind of setting up the, the two tag title feuds there, and also still a lot of bad blood between these factions now, especially with uh, God stealing the the Iron Fingers from Taichi. I mean, is is that a criminal offense stealing? Someone's eye in glove because honestly, the, the look on Tai Chi's face when it was gone was it was heartbreaking. Well, you know, in in, in the wrestling world, there's a, there's a lot of things that happen that <laughs> that should be crimes that people should be arrested for. But you know, in wrestling, people just seem to get away with stuff. Yeah, like some parlor patriots trying to storm the Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> they look the other way. It's crazy. It's crazy. But um, yeah, man, what I've really really loved about this is Tamatonga just like 
tweeting out all the different places he keeps taking <laughs> the, the iron glove. Yeah. It's been great. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's actually been a really nice, like, I've said this so many times, like, for me, like, the past few years, the tag division has been sort of a bit boring, but I feel like Dangerous Tech is coming in, like, not just because I'm a massive Tai Chi and Zach Sabre Jr. fan, but it's breathed, like, a new, fresh air into it, and their feud with G.O.D. has been great just because I can't remember the last time we've had a proper, like, heel versus heel feud in the tag division, and the two teams work amazingly together. Yeah, I really enjoyed their match at Russell Kingdom, and, yeah, I think when... GOD's motivated. I think Dangerous Tickers are awesome. And so, yeah, they, they had good chemistry. And now they're adding more wrinkles to this rivalry with, the you know, stealing the Iron Club and, and uh, GOD getting the titles from them. And so, like I kind of talked about on our, our preview show for Wrestle Kingdom, I feel like these two teams were going to be, like, feuding for, like, the, the first quarter of this year. Well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, deduction by numbers. There's no other tag teams. So yeah. sort of what they had to do. <laughs> right. But um, I think they're making the most of what they have. Um, I'm not hate. I loved surprisingly the match that they had at uh, Wrestle Kingdom. I don't know if that like you know streak will keep up at New Beginning because I've seen these two teams have you know less than desirable matches more times than not. But uh, if they can give us some more of what we saw at Wrestle Kingdom, like I'm all you know I'm down for it for sure. Uh, as yeah. far as far as the junior feud though, I think it'll be very interesting because we've never seen really this matchup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back to God. Can, oh, oh, go ahead. Tom. Yeah, can I can I quickly just say like also dangerous techers versus God is set up like a match of the century. Doki versus Jado, like <laughs> just just for that possibility of that match. I mean that that should be the match of Wrestle Kingdom just for way it's setting up. D- didn't he call Jado? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's the whole thing. Like everyone on social media has been going crazy. Like match of the century, Doki versus Jado, and. I mean, I love Doki anyway, so I just think, like, the fact that everyone's so excited about this match that may or may not happen, I think it's just one of the best things to come out of the G.O.D. Dangerous Techers feud. Well, we have to know what's the better weapon, the bent pipe or the kendo stick. <laughs> bent pipe, bent pipe. Bent pipe. <laughs> have you seen the fear Milano has in his face when Doki goes near him with the pipe? Yes. <laughs> um. And one thing I want to say uh, for G.O.D., what I would like to see in this feud with Dangerous Tickers, I'd like to see them bring out more of what they did with their feud with the Briscoes on Ring of Honor. Oh, absolutely. They had a blood mm-hmm. feud with those guys. They had some you know, some street fights, some ladder matches, some kind of intense brawling. And, and this is getting very heated. So I would like to see more of like that brawl intensity they brought in that Briscoes feud. Big fan. Now, before we move on, I have a quick question. So, Sonal, you keep mentioning how all these different people you like. It sounds like you're a big fan of so many different wrestlers. Let, let's be a little negative here. Who don't you like? <laughs> oh, um, okay, so one guy that I used to like, but don't evil. I used to be a, <laughs> when he was like King of Darkness. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he yes. was like my spirit animal. Now I'm just like, can you just go go away? Him and Dick Togo <laughs> cannot stand the two. I hate them so much. Oh. And not just he or he. Just, I just don't like them anymore. Oh, we're right we're, there we're, with we're you. We're here for this. You know, when, when Evil was LIJ, he wasn't my favorite, but, you know, I liked his little, you know, him trying to be the rock and smelling the air in his promos and doing the everything is evil. And, you know, he, he had some good never matches. And I was like, you know, he's you know, a fine yeah. little guy. And then this whole big heel main event turn happened, and I was like, "Boy." Well, I think uh, I think it's great we're talking about evil because that's actually going to lead into the fifth match of the night here. Yeah. Uh, unless you guys had anything to say about the junior side of this tag feud, I don't know. I mean, just because we we're talking about it, I love El Desperado and Kanemaru as well. That's just going to put out El Desperado should be junior champion at some point this year after his match with Hiromu at Best of Super Junior. So I just thought on the topic of wrestlers I like, I really love El Desperado. <laughs> yeah, Despi is awesome. Yeah, that, that Super Junior Finals was amazing. And I'm sure we'll see, for obviously right now they need something in the Junior Tag Division, but I'm sure eventually we will see him in some bigger kind of spotlight singles matches later this year. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's probably like one of the most well-established Junior Tag teams in Kanemaru and Despi against... Uh, you know, Ishimori and um, Phantasmo, and I think the big question, I mean, the real interesting thing here is kind of some of the remarks El Phantasmo made recently when he was interviewed with Kevin Kelly, 
kind of talking about how he wanted to be the breakout guy. He wanted to be the premier junior and star of Bullet Club. So there's a, a little bit of growing friction between the two guys, even though they're still partners. Um, and I think I, I just wonder if how that will play into the feud. But uh, overall, I mean, I don't really know how this match goes because I don't think we've seen this matchup very often between these two teams. So it should be interesting at the very least. I think the best thing New Japan can do is have a really good match here, but keep the belts on Despi and Kanemaru just because the junior title is so underrated because there's been the lack of teams. Because like, I think there's only about, especially with Rapongi 3K, there's like maybe two or three teams. Like They basically threw Wato and Taguchi together. But if you have Despi and Kanemaru lose it, like a strong established team who I think their last reign was the longest single like reign in history. Like, you're just going to devalue the tag belts, and you don't want that, because it's what happened with the never belts. My, right. My, my whole thing is that none of their tag belts really matter, and they just need one tag division, because if they had one tag division, then they'd have a plethora of tag teams, and then there'd be no concern about whether they're devaluing either belt, because it'd almost be impossible. But, right. I mean, I've lived with them devaluing both tag belts for the greater part of two decades, that it's like... I would like to see them value the belts. <laughs> I can't remember the last time they valued these belts, either of them. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I think the key here with this feud is pretty much who's going to be able to out-cheat each other. Yep. We've seen Fantasmo um, with the loaded boot that he's been using for the super kick. Yeah. We got Kanamaru who has the whiskey bottle. Despi, you know, he cheats all the time, low blows into the, the Gato clutch. Um so both both these teams are, are known for their, their cheating tactics. And so what will be interesting is Ishimori, not like we saw at Wrestle Kingdom, he took the turnbuckle, but really in the grand scheme of things, not known for being a cheater, considering he's in Bullet Club. Wasn't there a really good Bullet Club versus Suzuki Goon Jr. tag match? But wasn't it Robbie Eagles, the other guy that was in it? I, th- I think it might have been Eagles and Ishimori against... They were a good team. They, they were like... Yeah. I mean, even though we've said Eagles didn't work as a heel, I think because Ishimori's not as heelish as like El Fantasma, I think it worked as like a team and their styles are very similar. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's uh, let's talk about this fifth match with uh, the Chaos team of Goto, Okada, Ishii, Toriyano, and Yoshihashi. They defeated the Bullet Club team of Bad Luck Fale, Chase Owens, Evil... Jay White and Yujiro Takahashi, along with Dick Gato, <laughs> ah, Dick Togo and Gato. Dick Gato. <laughs> yeah, the they, they fused. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, good multi-man tag here. But I think you know people were expecting more to come from Jay White. He did eat the loss here, ate a brain buster from Tomohiro Ishii, um, and apparently, you know, there's there's a lot of questions on where Jay White is going. He, he had that big post match press conference saying, you know, maybe it's time he goes somewhere else, and you know, just being disappointed, and um, you know, just feeling, you know, he spent so much time his life into wrestling that he maybe just needs to go away. So there's a lot of rumors going around whether or not this is a work or if it's a shoot. If it, there's rumors that WWE. It's fielding offers. Um, you know, there's there's a rumor a couple of years ago that he had signed a seven year contract when uh, AEW and the Bucks had reached out to him to potentially coming to uh, to AEW. So there's a, there's a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation on the future of Jay White. I mean, I don't understand why anyone's speculating. It's pretty simple. We're going to see him debut in an empty Tropicana field in front of the Thunderdome <laughs> at the Royal Rumble. He will be number 30. And he's going to be wrestling, who's the WWE champion? Uh, Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre <laughs> for the title <laughs> at Raymond James Stadium. It's very simple. Uh, I mean, I've had so many people messaging me like, what do you think? And my reaction is, nope, he's not going anywhere. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, anything could happen. Like, I know there was an interview about a few years ago. I can't remember who it was with. And they was asked, cause obviously, when you're a top star in New Japan, the big question you always get asked if WWE contacts you, will you go? And Jay has said, he went, it's not the kind of wrestling he likes. And yes, I guess people can change their ideas and stuff, but people love Jay White because he's Jay White. And I've seen this ongoing joke on Twitter, and I think it's hilarious. He'll, if he goes to WWE, he'll go from Switchblade to Bar Knife. <laughs> Jay will not be allowed to, like, Jay thrives on being able to swear, being charismatic, like, 
he can't do that in WWE. So I feel like if his contract does end, I can't see him going to WWE just for the case that it's going to just reverse everything and he's going to end up doing like, I don't watch WWE anymore. He's going to end up, who's a jobber there at the moment? Uh, I know. He's Dolph Ziggler. Right, so he's going to end up... Well, I'm Dolph Ziggler is a tag team champion, sir. <laughs> he's still a job. <laughs> um, yeah, he's going to be battling him in like a match of like five minutes. Right. I don't know. And then losing, so... Jay, Jay, just... Jay White is going to be changed from Jay White to Jay Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, His brother sorry, Abigail. Just, yeah. Imagining that's just like... I just can't like... For me, because Jay White's why I started watching New Japan properly, I can't imagine him anywhere else. Um, but yeah, even I had to admit when he did the post match promo on the second night where he was like, This is not Jay White's Jamie, like it broke my heart. But <laughs> I like to think that maybe when he said he wants to go somewhere else, it means like he doesn't want to wrestle. I mean, not that, but like he'll go away for a bit and then come back. Or maybe that like, he wants to get away from Bullet Club because you know right. what? As I said at the start, Chaos can take him again and I'll be very happy. Right, and I think the two the thing that people are kind, of, are kind of missing too here is the fact I, f- I feel this is a work just based off of the history of New Japan and what happens at New Year's Dash. We've seen in the past, uh, former Bullet Club leader Kenny Omega, um, the, the year that Kenny lost to Okada after Wrestle Kingdom 11, he had a, the, the press conference where he was like, you know, I, I need to take some time away. But that was very real. Yeah, and, and there was a lot of questions on you know whether or not he's coming back, and he ended up coming back and doing another year. Um, and we see a lot of departures, you know, Nakamura, Gals and Anderson, um, Balor, like all these guys that leave right around after New Year's Dash. And so I think that New Japan is playing into that, knowing that people know people leave and go to WWE or go somewhere else. I think they're playing into that to make you think, oh, yeah, there's a real possibility that Jay could leave. But I don't think Jay is going anywhere. I, I think that he will come back. I know there, there were posters um, advertising him for the anniversary show. Um, and so I, I think that it's, it's, it's a big work, and I think he's going to come back and make a big impact in a couple months. Well, I uh, mean, if Jay White does go to WWE, it's gone down in my estimation then because he's made a very bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, let's say hypothetically he did go to WWE. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, like, if that's your thing, you want to get paid, and let's, you know, there's no bones about it. There is nowhere else that you can – cash in and make the kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, income for you and your family and, you know, your future as you can there. So, I mean, I'm sure they would treat him well. I mean, the the bottom line is if you headline the Tokyo Dome, you get a kind of special treatment that other wrestlers who sign with this company do not get. You're not going to NXT. Like, you (laughs) are going to the, you know, and a a lot of people don't want to hear that, but, like, it is sort of that one, to me, it's that one prerequisite. If you were in the dome in the main event, you're gonna start off on the main roster. What about period. Nakamura? Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I was gonna say because. But you know what? That was, like, was be- like that was before though. Was it not? <laughs> like that was like a whole year before AJ. Well, they left. They leave at the same time. Oh my mm. god! I guess they did. Yeah, it was both their last match was Wrestle Kingdom ten. Huh? Very interesting. Well, that that <laughs> pokes holes in my thing. <laughs> but like, I just I couldn't see Jay White going to NXT. Mm-hmm. I literally couldn't see that. Like, I uh, there's no way he would leave for that kind of deal or that kind of money. Like, yeah. unless they needed to teach him how to work a hard cam and you know how to roll and all yeah. that shit. The only reason why I could see an NXT being possible is just with the Wednesday Night Wars and now AEW is doing their little Bullet Club reunion, and so you might want to get you know. Former Bullet Club leader Jay White on Wednesdays on the opposite side, and you could have Jay and Finn Balor do something. Well, yeah, they have that connection, so that does make sense. Yeah, yeah. but you know, Can I, like I don't want to sound like thing because I don't watch the video anymore. Is Punishment Martinez? Is he still in NXT? Yeah, he is. Yeah, right. So if Jay does go NXT, because I loved when him and, and Martinez did their feud in Ring of Honor mm. for the US title. So I'd see, I'd watch that again <laughs> if, um, if he has to go. So send him to NXT just for that. Uh, well, we should talk about, you know, the source of this. So, I mean, all, all reporting, you know, members of the media had pretty much said that had been repeating the widely, you know, speculated uh, information about his contract was that he signed a seven year deal in what, 2018? Yeah. That would make him, mm-hmm. um, you know, beholden to the company till 2024. Well, Last week, there was a report from Super J Cast 
uh, good friends of the show, and they pretty much said that they were hearing that his contract was in fact up, that the previously reported date of 2024 was in fact not accurate, and that you know there was a 50-50 chance about which way he would go, and WWE was making a heavy play to get him to join the company. Um, you know, and I even listened to Observer. They actually, re- they didn't name them specifically, but they said, you know, a trusted source that's out there that's been accurate many times in, in the past, um, you know, is reporting this. As far as we know, it's this. So it's like there is conflicting reports. I mean, um, if if you want my two cents about it, I, I think he signed till 2024 based on the plethora of information that we've received. I mean, I, I don't, I hate to question, you know, um, there's no doubt that the guys at JCAS have been accurate many, many times. They definitely talk to people in the company, but everybody who talks to the company is saying the company is not saying anything about this, you know, whether he signed or not signed, which screams work to me. Right. And the <laughs> fact that everyone who, you know, like knew about, you know, what his contract status was previously, they all said he was signed, you know, two years ago. So, I mean, I, I think that this is, just heavily a storyline based on the comments he made in his promo based on the fact that this rings like it's completely a a, a 100% a fabricated wrestling storyline. And you know, the fact that he got beat clean by Ishii, but then it seemed, but Ishii is like also the guy that sort of has his number based off the G one. This is classic Gato booking. And you know, Ishii cut that promo talking about how like, you know, if he gets himself back together, he can come back stronger it sounds like they're going to have another match down the line. Right. I mean, I don't know, man. This, to me, I, I, I'm like 98% certain that this guy's not even, not under contract. It's not even a question. Like, like I don't even think he's, I don't, even, and here's the thing is like that terminology. It's like, well, 50, 50 chance. That sounds very wishy washy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't sound at all like very concrete. Like he is 100% not signed. You know what I mean? Like, right. I, I think it's yeah. just so up in the air, to be honest with you. And I almost think his promo at Wrestle Kingdom, normally when we've had people, like, not re-signing, they've not been so, like... Dramatic? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, there were people who aren't even Jay White fans on Twitter who were like, oh, my God, like, it's heartbreaking. And it's like, <laughs> would they give him that, like, would they have given him that massive match building him up and then have that really emotional storyline and then just have that tossed around like people this is getting people interested they're like oh my god are we gonna have like a baby face jay because it was quite a baby face promo like he was like see you always like do this to me and when i'm hurting and i can't even walk you don't help me yeah and I feel like why would they give him that platform to be emotional and like develop his character just to go by yeah we've seen um in the past where people who were near the end of their, uh, you know, their contracts be in major positions just like him. We've seen it, like you mentioned, with AJ Styles, with Shinsuke Nakamura. We saw it with Kenny Omega. So, I mean, that's nothing new. But you don't see them having this big angle-esque, you know, center like this big you know promo at the end of the night where where every the whole wrestling world is talking about it like if if in fact like let's say hypothetically he is actually like on the fence and he might actually leave the new japan are fucking idiots they shouldn't have let him cut that promo they shouldn't have given him (laughs) because because all the goodwill (laughs) that's going on them now is going to go to vince or go to tony khan or whoever whoever it is that quote unquote signs the guy this is an angle this is 100% an angle. Like I, I'm not even like, you know, and I haven't, I haven't heard anything confirmed, but guess what? No, neither has anybody else at all no. because yeah. the company's not talking to anybody about this. Yeah. I, honestly, I feel like if he was leaving, I feel like they would have done a little bit more of a dramatic way to like end his character. Like we've seen that, mm-hmm. you know, with AJ getting kicked out and some other guys like they, they kind of have this kind of big thing where they they kind of get rid of them, so you know, like this character is done for sure. All he did was lose to Ishii. Yes, he lost. You can quote unquote say he lost on the way out, but I mean, it's he's lost. He lost Ishii before, and so it's not really like yeah. a thing that's like, oh yeah, I think he's leaving. I think the big thing also is we've got unfinished business with him and Eva. Like you said, AJ got kicked out. There is still this massive storyline within Bullet Club. They're not just going to have him go without tackling that in some way. Well. They- I mean, we never got a payoff to the original 
you know, Bullet Club Civil War anyway. So <laughs> we, we see stuff go unresolved sometimes. But I, I think that this is all an angle. I think that – and, you know, it's interesting too is when he was like, I don't want to do this anymore, you know. Uh, I think that's one of the big talking points uh, that really came out of that, you know, fantastic mm-hmm. promo. And what did he mean by that? There's so many different ways you can interpret it. It could be, yeah. you know, I don't want to wrestle anymore. I don't want to wrestle here anymore. I don't want to wrestle for the Bullet Club anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, who knows what, you know, it was so enigmatic that there's a lot of wiggle room for wh- where they're going to go creatively with him next, provided he does stay, which I'm sure he is. Yeah. And, and that's what we had, like, I was thinking with the Ishii promo after that match, like, is he sick of Bullet Club? Is he going to go back to chaos? Like, and there was somebody crazily when it could be L-I-J, like J-A-Y. <laughs> I, mean, I can't imagine that. But yeah, like that's the thing. It was so open, that comment, that it could mean anything. He could maybe take a few months off and then come back like a completely new person. Right. And so we do have some questions here about Jay that we can get into. Uh, so first from Rambo and Slam Pig, he says, Reassure me that Jay White isn't going anywhere. Like the wise man once said, you don't know what you got until it's gone. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. There's your music. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that entirely. Um, yeah, don't worry. I, th- I think Jay is staying, staying <laughs> with us, staying with the lion mark. And I'm, I'm not one to like stick my, you know, like, you know, I'm not going to predict something unless I feel 100 percent confident about it. Like, I'm, I would be so shocked if he actually left. Like, so, yeah, so would I. The only, the, here's the one thing. That makes me think maybe hypothetically, let's say it was up is what if he just felt like they are never going to actually use me as the top guy, you know, mm-hmm. and that was a kind of a conversation I had with Rich. Um, he talked about, you know, the last couple of years, he's been the de facto top heel within the company. And now you've got the rise of evil as well as Will Ospreay concurrently at the same time, which kind of threatens his spot. So it's like, is there a lot more that they can do with the switchblade character as it is, or do they, are they at the point where they're at the tail end of that and they need to transfer him to a baby face? And how much wiggle room is there for him as a baby face? When you also have Naito, Ibushi and Okada and Tanahashi, you know, all kind of there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely an interesting situation there. Uh, next question from Reddit user Viking Pain says, "Let's say our friends at the Super J Cast are right and Jay does choose to leave. How big of a loss would that be? Who, how would you replace him? Would you money ball it by using guys like Evil, Kenta, and Tamla to cover up for it, or would you start to build someone else to take over? <clears throat> excuse me, someone else to take over like ELP or maybe even someone new like Carl Fredericks? I mean, that's a thing. I mean, it's happened before where people have said, oh, there's going to be a big hole if so and so leaves." And New Japan have found a way to sort of fill that hole. So obviously I'd be upset if JY left, but I think as a company, New Japan have coped with this millions of times before and they'll have a backup plan. But I would like to see new established heels. Like, So like Carl Fredericks, I think, would be an amazing person to have. Like, Because his character, like, he's just graduated from the dojo. I think it'd be nice to have some new heel faces because if you think about it, Bullet Club and suzuki Gun have all got established stars. We need some new young lines coming in, like graduating and becoming heels. Yeah, I think for like the the immediate future, I think with the, the rise of the Empire, I think Will Ospreay is somebody that could easily kind of slip in as the, the top heel gaijin role. Um, and then you can kind of have Evil become the new leader of Bull Club for the time being, I guess. Um, but I, I think Ospreay would be the short-term answer as far as taking Jay's spot. But then, yeah, you, there's a, a bunch of other people that you could kind of bring in and groom. And that's what we've seen with New Japan the last several years. They, they lose people, and then either they, they sign new people or it, it gives opportunities to people who are already on the roster or to young Lions who are coming back from excursion. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have much to kind of add here. I mean, if he did leave, it would be, um, you know, it'd be a detriment of course, because they've invested so much in him, and I don't know that they've gotten the full payout of what they put into him. But, I mean, at the same time, every time that they've ever lost somebody, they've been able to pivot very quickly and, you know, kind of re- replenish and replace. And like I mentioned early, earlier, we've already got two major heel, you know, units with, you know, top guys 
kind of right on the cusp, mm -hmm. um, sort of ready to kind of fill that role. Um, you know, and I could even see ELP being like a major heel, you know, potentially down the line as well for, for the heavyweight. I mean, he's pretty tall. Like he's got the frame to fill out and kind yeah. of be that guy as well. Um, so yeah, I, but I mean, at the end of the day, like I just I don't think he's leaving. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question here from Reddit user Vera Sabian: uh, Could my love for Jay White possibly survive through the horrors and ravages of WWE booking? Oh, I mean, I'd hope so. If you've got a big love, <laughs> I know. I mean, personally, I think I'd have to maybe start watching WWE again if Jay White did go. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully your love would remain like mine would. It'd be hard. But I would try. I don't uh, see that's a hard question to, to answer because you have to ask yourself, what do you mean by love? I mean, what is the definition of, <laughs> of your, your love for this person? That's, you know? that's getting deep now. Because <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes let's let's call it what it is. If he left, that'd be a breakup. And I mean, can you can you love that person from afar? Can you love them for who they are, <laughs> even if they change when you're not there? I mean, that's the real question here. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, I like Jay for who he is, but if he changes, is that going to be, is that going to be the same relationship? Yeah, mm. I, I'll tell you, I don't love AJ Styles and Nakamura, which I would have told you years ago, that was impossible. But, you know, people grow <laughs> apart and they change and that's a part of life and that's OK. So, you know, that's my two cents. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it will definitely put your love to the test. He he might get a fireball shot at his face. He he might have a you know a swamp match. He you know he might have to you know He'll probably get beat up at, in a food fight at Thanksgiving or some shit. Right? You, you, you know <laughs> who knows what, what will happen to him. Listen, if you love him, let him go. <laughs> <laughs> and if he's yours, he will return. <laughs> uh. So uh, let's move on to the main event here of New Year's Dash. Oh, but the one thing I want to say before we move on, I was just so shocked when, you know, this man ate a clean freaking brain buster. And then you think you're like waiting for it, waiting for it. Like, here comes the angle. No angle. They just the, move. The like, they just, just usher him out. out. Yeah. Also, did something happen at the end of this where, like, they set up something between evil and... Okada, because I didn't notice anything, but people seem to like have noticed uh, stuff. I mean, they I were. I didn't, but it wasn't until the post match comments that uh, I saw something. And then there was a picture of like Okada staring evil down, which I didn't see, but literally just saw, you know, on New Japan 1972 when they showed the match highlights. Yeah. And I, that came past like, did I miss something? Was I too invested in Jay to see that there was <laughs> another storyline getting set up? Yeah, I recall like them having a lot of interactions in the ring, and then post match they did like kind of stare each other down when uh, Evil was walk getting ready to walk to the back. I, I I'm fine, you know. <laughs> if if uh if Okada wants to get back that uh New Japan Cup win, I'm all about it. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the main event here, the Lij team: Bushi, Hiromu, Sonata, Shingo, and Naito. Defeated Tanahashi, Ibushi, Master Wato, Rocky Romero, and Cho. We had Ibushi getting the big win here in the main event over Master Wato. Getting the closing match promo to uh, challenge Master Wato to a uh, big singles match that we'll see here on this uh, New Beginning Tour. Is there any way that that's not a disaster? Uh, I mean... Okay. When, when was the last time Ibushi carried anybody to a great match? Think about it. Mm, you, got, you got a point. I can't remember him carrying anybody. I was very surprised that Bushi closed out New Year's Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was my big thing. Like, seriously, Bushi? I love Bushi. Like, of all the I people, love most yeah. of the wrestlers, but still. Remember last year he beat Zack Sabre Jr. in a one-on-one -on -one match, like, leading into the Tokyo Dome? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of weird Bushi moments. Uh, but, yeah, I was expecting, you know, maybe Sonata to get the win here. Since he's going to be challenging Ibushi or, or Shingo or, you know, somebody like Hiromu to kind of, you know, continue to set up some of these bigger matches that they, they set up in this multi-man match here. But I guess it was, you know, very important to set up this Wato and Bushi match. Got to set Wato up for a big, they got to hype him up because there's been so much negativity. Like we were talking about Okan. It's a similar with Wato, the way in which they returned. It's almost like people have now got very negative thoughts to both of them and maybe new japan just want to hype up water with his um 
best dad, Tenzan, who hopefully should be fine for that singles match to walk <laughs> him out like the supportive daddy is. Listen, I, I want to love Wato, but he's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but this uh, this match was fine. Um, yo, did you see that Dave Meltzer gave uh, he gave he gave the Suzuki Goon versus Tiger Mask and Yuya Yamura match four stars. He gave that ten minute nothing match four stars. Hey, bro. I guess it he, was it was it was because of Salty Tiger Mask. Yeah, he was like obsessed with Salty Tiger Mask, bro. That's he gave that a higher score than Tanahashi and Okan. Think about that for a second. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> this man's lost it. <laughs> Uh, but speaking of Watto, we had to have a question here from uh, Red User Vera Sabian. Can anything done be done to save Master Watto from being Yoshihashi, or is it already too late? Well, oh, okay, that right. One, don't insult Yoshihashi. Right <laughs> right okay, that is one thing. I, you can insult Jay White, you can insult Rapongi 3K, but don't insult Yoshihashi in front of me because that <laughs> that that's serious business. Now, I think it Master Watto sort of had issues like coming in he came out and there was like no crowds there and I just think pairing him with Tenzan as well hasn't helped I think what Marta needs is a huge character adjustment because his style is great I really like the mix of Lucha Libre and Japanese style he just needs a new character and to get away from Taguchi Japan uh, <laughs> um I, I don't know. Like, my my whole thing is I'm actually kind of different on that. I think that I like his style, but I think that he's not proficient at the things he's doing because he's botching far too often in his matches and getting lost and just having these these moments where things are just not cohesive. And so I don't know what that is because when we watched him, and we say this all the time, when we watched him as a lion, this was never an issue. I never saw this guy mess up as a lion. It was only when he went to Mexico. I don't know what was in the water, like what <laughs> happened, but something yeah. s- something with his confidence or with his style disconnected between, you know, Fantastic Mania a couple years ago and then now. But um can I just like quickly um you were saying this. I found that when I watched his cuz he won a title in CMLL and I watched a few of his CMLL matches and not that they're bad workers there in CMLL, but I see a lot more, like when I watch, I went through a phase where I watched a lot of CMLL, there was a lot more botches there. And I, I sort of, that's why I thought coming back, I was like, is Wato going to have that New Japan? It sort of feels like he, maybe he has lost it. Maybe he's got too much of that recklessness from CMLL, which has sort of got rid of the refinement he had in the dojo. It's possible. Yeah, and something that we've, we've talked about here on the show too is just, just the confidence issue of you know, hearing. I'm sure he's seeing fan feedback and, you know, not the crowd not being able to, you know, react at shows. I'm sure there's a lot of issues that are maybe just relating to him to why he's maybe he's just not fully embracing or has, I don't know, a lack of understanding of what his actual character is. Maybe he's just not attached to the character and maybe that's like hurting his confidence and his inner performance. I don't know. I mean, but as far as like the Yoshihashi thing, I mean, I mean, that would probably be a good career trajectory for him because look at where Yoshiashi's at now after all these years. So I don't know. Um, they de- they got to do something. Like, I do feel like, in a sense, we are talking about a Yoshihashi situation because for so many years the question was, well, what do they do to fix Yoshihashi? Well, now they've kind of fixed him, and he has all the goodwill in the world, and people like him, and that wasn't the case before. So I, I'm not really sure what they do with Wato, whether he needs a new character, a new gimmick, a new coat of paint, a new move. I think also we've got to remember, Wato's still very young. Yeah, yes, so right, yeah. that is going to make a big thing. Like, I'm trying to think, is there anyone who's come back from excursion? Because he started the dojo so early, went on excursion for like three years. Has someone come back that young? Because he's about 22, 23. I'm, I'm pretty sure, like... Uh... Space Lone Wolf Tiger freaking Muta was like around that age when he was he was much better than Watto. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think like he's quite young, and I think maybe that's gonna be an, that's always gonna be an issue. And you mentioned confidence and things. It's a hard time for him to come back, and it's he's gonna see the negative feedback online, and I think that is gonna affect him. Yeah, and I think another thing that. Um, 
maybe just the, the length of his excursion too, because you know, obviously COVID kind of hit when he was still on excursion, and so maybe his excursion got cut short, and you know, maybe he he was supposed to be gone longer, and for whatever reason, it decided to uh, bring him back sooner. To be fair, I think he was gone about two and a half years, which is quite long compared to other people mm. on excursion. But I think Water would have probably done well to do a mixed excursion. So Mexico, then maybe Britain or Mexico and the US, just to like balance it out. And maybe that would have given him more confidence going against, because the Mexican crowds are a lot different to Japanese crowds, which are different to US fans, which are different to UK fans. Right. So I think, Maybe if he, because his length was quite long compared to maybe Jay or like Show and Yo. But yeah, Show and Yo, they had mixed. So they did America and CMLL. I think it would have worked perfectly for him to do something like that. And maybe it would have helped him coming back. Yeah, that, that, that should have been great. Yeah, they should have possibly, yeah, maybe try to get him in, in Ring of Honor, do some stuff there. Or maybe they could have sent him to the UK. I know, you know they had Oka Okan over there. They had uh, Shoto Amina over there. Um, so maybe that that could have been a better place for him, and maybe a, a better, better style for him to, to work on. Um, so moving on to the next question here, uh, Reddit user, why did you do that, bro? Ask thoughts on Abushi. I do want to say one thing. Uh, freaking Hanari never gets the kind of opportunities that they gave Watto, and he never messes up the way Wat- that Watto has been messing up. So I just want to no, throw that out there. I love that you brought that up because I I think I because I did like a video where it was like top five guys I want to see in the G1 and I put Hanari down and people like I don't get why you like so Hanari doesn't get enough credit like he is an amazing worker great talent great personality great like fighting spirit and I'm just like New Japan he's not a young lion anymore just he's like a guy who I think he should go on excursion come back completely new and maybe then New Japan will be like yeah Hanari deserves to be like shot up that rocket ladder. Yeah, they're definitely we talk about it all the time. Something needs to be done with Hanari. The guy is super talented, always has great matches, and for whatever reason, like you mentioned, yes, yeah, it's, it's Alnski still a young lion. Like he he only gets wins mainly over other lions, and then he's usually eating pins and tags and losing big singles matches. They're giving him that Ishii treatment. They're gonna treat him like a jobber for like six years and then you know, basically, like, one one time he's going to get in the G1 and fucking kill it, and people are going to be like, where did this guy come from? <laughs> like, he's been here the whole time. And then he's yeah. never going to win the IWGP title, ever. <laughs> like, Ishii or Suzuki. Yeah. It's like, killing in every match, just never getting that top title. Uh, well, speaking of the top title, we had a question here from Why Did You Do That, Bro? He said, thoughts on Ibushi wanting to unify the belts? Not happy about Not that, like, I get why what Ibushi's talking about like they've been defended together why not unite them but I think especially at the moment with the fact we've got no US title unite those titles what have you got for like the top guys like really then you've got the never title which is like the next big thing and when did when did you ever think you were going to say the never title is one of the top New Japan titles oh I've I've always felt like the never the never title is the top title in New Japan (laughs) That's the real man's belt. <laughs> I mean, apart from that, my top title is the C Block Championship. <laughs> That's definitely the top title with Suji holding at the moment. I, th- I think it's really two sided. You know, on the one hand, they have like kind of unified the belts anyway. So, why, you know, what logical step would there really be to, you know, de unify them? You know, we, we met, we gave them a lot of. Uh, possible outs as far as storylines earlier in the year and they didn't take any of them and now we're a year apart and they're still together and at this point you know they're not going to be defended separately so you know it was kind of on abushi to to either say i would like to have these separated or unified and he was like let's unify them so i mean on that hand it's like all right well you might as well just do it but then on on the other end you're kind of erasing the legacy of your number two belt within the company you know so see you nakamura see you naito there goes (laughs) everything that you put into this but what's funny is you're saying that because remember like ibushi craved so much the ic title because it was held by his gods so now is he just saying oh i don't really care nakamura tanahashi it's fine just get rid of the title that all of my favorite people in the world held well i think i think in all fairness he's saying that they should be unified i i don't think he's advocating that they be um 
you know, completely forgotten. But I, I think he's like, ad, at least this is what I assume he's advocating for a double crown. Right. You know? You're right. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the other the other thing, too, is like from a practical standpoint, you built up a title that could have headlined major, major shows. And now you don't have one. You know, could you could you get another title? Um, to, to headline, could you headline with the never title or with the tag belts or with the junior belt? Absolutely, you could, but you already had a belt that was worthy of headlining shows and you did it for years and now it's gone. So, you know, what are you going to do on those off tours or when you want to break up new beginning in the, you know, two or three nights? Like, what the fuck are you going to do? Right. Well, I think we've already seen like the, the never title. Um, they've already started to use that in, in a main event role. Um, I think the U.S. title, um, you know, if that that ever comes back, that could be something that that gets elevated. Um, if and, we ever see it again, right? Uh, but yeah, it's uh, th- at this point, I do think it, you might as well just unify them because they they're not planning on defending them separately. But on the other end, kind of like you were saying, Josh, I do kind of hate that we would lose kind of that that lineage and that le- that legacy of the IC title and a guy like Nakamura who got that title to main event the Dome one year and just the, kind of the history of that title. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a sticky situation. But who was the guy that um, that with the the giant Don King hair at Wrestle Kingdom? The the comedian guy. Yeah. I forget his name now. I well, can't remember, but he was hilarious. I'm pretty sure he's the secret hand behind the IWGP. He's the secret power of the IWGP. And I think that man needs to step in and, you know, basically make a judgment call and say, no, we're not unifying these belts. In fact, guess what, Abushi? White belt, gone. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> and then um, and then he can order, you know, the winner of the New Japan Cup to hold the belt. Because I think someone in management should be, just be like, all right, enough of this foolishness. You know, we did the double gold. It's done. And also, I was never a fan of anybody other than Naito holding it. Because I, I assumed when they gave it to him, it was going to be that one special accomplishment that he'd always rest his hat on. And be like, I was the only guy. But now he's like, I'm the only guy except this other guy and this other guy. Right. Also, Naito said he what he didn't like defending them both. He even said he was like, this right. is not why I did this. He's like, I wanted to hold them and defend them separately. It's just none of his opponents. Well, fair enough. None of his opponents are going to. I think I'm just going to take one of those belts. Well, that's, but that's because that's what he wanted. That's because he's a worker and he planned to lay down for evil when the white belt was on the line <laughs> to get him out of there. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, there's, it's, yeah, somebody just, just needs to make a decision on, on what they do going forward. Bro, the guy with the hair, <laughs> who is the secret hand of the IWGP, that's who needs to do it. Well, yeah, so, yeah, get get him back on, on the screen. And He's get the him. power that, he is the GM of New Japan Pro Wrestling, it's just no one knows it. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so, uh, next question comes from the Maple Leaf Wrestling History Podcast. He has two questions. His first, do you think, do you guys think, Gales proceeds Kota Ibushi as a top tier level champion, or perhaps like a Dusty Rhodes type of belt chaser. Only time will tell how long Ibushi holds the gold, but historically speaking, he has always been a short term transitional champion. Your opinions? I think Ibushi is a short term transitional champion. Or like mm. maybe like Jay White was like his reign as heavyweight that was transitional. Kind of, it definitely was in the sense of like he only held it for like four months, and I think he didn't even did he he didn't have a title defense, did he? No, I think he uh, he lost it right. Okada was his first defense. Yeah. I think it was about two months, two three months. I don't think it was even as much as four months. You're right. You're he, right. Won, he, he won it in, in like beginning. February. That's right. Yeah, and, and then, then he lost, lost it in April. Yeah, April. Yeah, in Mad Square Garden. Yeah, but that's pretty standard for guys when they have their first title reign. You know, like we saw that with uh, Okada and different people throughout history. But for me, I think Ibushi is was strictly set up. So that he can drop the belt to like maybe Will Ospreay. Mm. But can I put out that at least he didn't drop it after one day? Because that's what <laughs> I thought. Yeah. If it yeah. happened to anyone, it would happen to a boot. <laughs> yeah, that would that would have been horrible. Um, yeah, I mean, time's gonna tell. I mean, Abushi did sign, you know, the, the, the lifetime contract, and that's kind of been the big thing that's hurt him in his time in New Japan is not being exclusive to the company, and now he is so. Who knows? You know, he's not getting any younger. Maybe they they might want to go with a little bit of a longer title run with him. Maybe. Fingers crossed. But maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, I mean, yeah, he could easily lose it in, in his first or second defense, but well, he's not losing it in his first defense. We know that much. Oh well, yeah, that's right. Because he's facing <laughs> Sonata. So that would have been a day. Yeah. So he has. Uh, that's right. Well, yeah. So his oh second. yeah, that's right. He's gonna have two, two. successful. T- Bro, he's fucking losing it to Will Ospreay. <laughs> We'll see what happens. Uh, so the second question is, he said, I'm certain you talked about this before, but hypothetically speaking, what are your speculations on the future state of the IWGP title? Should it be separated from the IT, IC title this year? Should the IC be defunct? Should Coda win another mid-card belt and make it a triple crown? H crown. They need No a- triple crown. I don't <laughs> want a triple crown. Eight belts. It should be the IWGP title, the IC belt, the U.S. title, the Never title, the Rev Pro belt, the NWA title... Um, what about the never six man? No, only ha- only singles belts. Uh, uh, I need the, the I, junior title. No, the I junior. need no. It's H Ibushi crown. could do it's, the junior. It's the heavy crown. I need two more belts. CMLL. Yeah, he's gonna get the CMLL belt <laughs> and he's gonna get the Ring of Honor title. That's the H crown. <laughs> oh my! <God. laughs> oh man! But yeah, I feel like we could, we've kind of talked about how we how we felt about the titles. Uh, Going forward, yeah, I don't think there should be a triple crown. I don't even think there should. Be, I don't, I'm still kind of in the in the middle of whether or not it should even should be a double crown. But at this point, if they're not going to break them up, then they might as well unify them. If they are going to keep the icy belts around, they need to actually get a real belt and stop carrying around that freaking uh, the belt they have now. The one that Tanahashi built, it's like uh, it's replica quality. And like when you see the two belts <laughs> next to each other, they look completely different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they might as well have had you know the one Naito like threw around. At least that looked a bit more like genuine. Yeah. Yes. Uh, speaking of Naito, question here from Rambo and Slam Pig: What is next for Naito? They teased a little jealousy between him and Hiromu, and their match last year never happened due to COVID. Is that next? He's going for the never belt. <laughs> That's what he's gonna. He's gonna. He's gonna take that off Shingo, and then he's gonna be the king of never. I don't know about Naito, but he brings up Hiromu and uh, Naito from the anniversary show next year. I think if we play our cards right, we might be getting Kota Ibushi against Hiromu at the anniversary show, which I'm all about that. Yeah, that would be absolutely incredible. I mean, well, also- I'm, I'm also slightly worried about that because these two are crazy. Like, I thought <laughs> Naito versus Ibushi was bad. I'm worried to think what Hiromu versus Ibushi is going to be like. Oh, we almost saw Hiromu die. In Daytona, yeah, the, when they were in that match together, Golden Lovers against was uh, that the CEO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want that was crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm all in for that matchup. Uh, but as far as what's next for Naito, see, this would be a perfect reason why to have a title separated because you could have a popular guy like Naito get back that IC title, and you can main event shows Naito as IC champ. But there is an argument against that, and it's the same argument Naito's made in the past. He's like, what is the point of this title? You know, it's it's a belt for guys that can't be the champion. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, I mean, from a bit, I see the point of it from a business standpoint and from the f- fact that it has a legacy, but I could also see why you might just get rid of it because it's like, can you not competently book guys that have secondary feuds that aren't for the title that matter, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's next for him because in, in that multi man, they, they didn't tease anything really for him. And on in the, the new beginning tour, there's nothing really set up for him. So I, I think there's nothing next for him. And I'll tell you why. I don't think this is going to be a year heavy on storylines and feuds like we would traditionally see because, much like last year, I think until this COVID epidemic is gone, we're going to be relying on tournaments. And Mm -hmm. storylines that are derived from tournaments And I think he's just going to be a major player In those tournaments all year long And that's about it you know, that, that, that's, that's the best that they can do Because why book a long term feud That's going to have meaning Yeah. When you don't know They literally could do a show building up And then the next month they might have no shows And then you just ruin that momentum Um, But one thing I will say is There's money in an Osprey And Naito match They've held it off for quite a while they've kept them apart from each other and um you know we, i've always talked in the past about how this company loves to have the long kept apart big match so that they can do it at say a wrestle kingdom or a g1 mm-hmm. and i think that that match has g1 or wrestle kingdom written all over it down the road whether it's you know this year or next year i don't know but i think that is for sure you know in the cards yeah definitely a big money match down the line 
Uh, next question here from Kevin from DC. First, he says, "Congrats to everyone who picked Kota Ibushi to walk out of the Tokyo Dome with a double gold. It was certainly possible that Ibushi would have been gatoed and left with a one-day title reign after losing to Jay White on night two. Now, in his backstage comments after the event, Ibushi stated that his goal is to unify the belt. My question is, what does he even mean by this? These belts have essentially been unified since this time last year in something but name and title lineage." Ibushi can't lose the IC title as a heavyweight champ without looking weak, and if he relinquishes the IC title, then he's failed in his stated goal. Sometimes I think Kota speaks his mind without considering what he's saying. Fair enough. That is basically Ibushi in a nutshell. Like he does things and says things before he thinks about it. <laughs> um, I think we pretty much covered this, but I mean, you know, I think what he's saying is it needs to just be one title, you know? Very similar. Now, here's here's the big question. Um, in All Japan, when they created the Triple Crown, that became essentially an entirely new title that was comprised of three other title lineages. But when you look at the lineage, it's not like it goes all the way back to those three. It starts in 1989. Mm-hmm. You know, if they were to do this, that's my question as a belt you know, and history, like, kind of geek, is this still, like, are you literally just taking the IC title and amalgamating it into the IWGP title? <laughs> or are we, are you creating a new double title and... New history, yeah. A new history, <laughs> and the IWGP title is just kind of cut off at that point because I don't think I like that idea. Now yeah. that I hear it out loud, I'm not a big fan of that idea at all. Yeah, I know, I know different promotions do it differently. We've seen other promotions where they, they unify titles and they keep the lineage of the, the most prominent prominent title. That's what they'd probably do. Yeah, which I hope they do because I, I, I would, you would, you know, the champion roll call, like you would hate to lose like the legacy and lineage of the IWGP heavyweight mm-hmm. title. Yeah, I mean, we were complaining earlier about like, you know, Naito, Tanahashi, Goto, and uh, Nakamura, but I mean, fuck them. I mean,. Uh, you know, <laughs> Inoki. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also asks, he says, there's no getting around it. Master Wato was a little bit more than sloppy in his junior tag title match of Taguchi against Suzuki Goon. There's still time to say, well, he's only 23, but soon people will stop calling it nerves and start calling for his head or at least his spot on the roster. Do you still see a wait for it? Way to the Grand Master for young Wato? Also, performance notwithstanding, the story called for Wato to pin Kanemaru as revenge for Jingu since Kanemaru was out of Best Super Juniors. Do you prefer this idea or the idea that they went with where Despy pinned the funky weapon? On a related note, his Wrestle Kingdom gear is miles ahead of his previous pink and blue attire. You know, I did actually bring up that Taguchi had new gear. Because a lot of people don't realize, they're like, oh, it's Gucci in green. If you look at it each time, they're a different color, and it's a big thing. <laughs> yeah, the, the dragon on his tights are always, like, different colors, and the funky yeah. weapon on, on the back of his trunks are always, like, different, like, colored patterns. Nah, it's the same. I like the it's orange the one, the orange and green one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, kind of like we were talking about with, with Watto earlier, um, yeah, there, there's something that needs to be done. I mean... Yeah, there was kind of a story there of him getting a win back from Kanemaru. I mean, technically, he did get that win back on the road to Tokyo Dome shows. He didn't. He did pin Kanemaru to help set up the junior tag title match. So, in a way, he did kind of get the pin back. He just hasn't gotten it back in like a singles match. Um, so maybe they're they're going to save that down the line for for a singles match. Um, but yeah, I yeah, I don't know what they're, what they're going to do with Wato going forward here. I, I don't think I don't think they'll have his head because he's New Japan born and raised basically, and I feel like they're not like other companies where they'll just black by because they've invested they invested so long in Wato. Uh, I think he's talking about the fans. Oh. How, how long will the will people stop saying he's only twenty three and start saying, does this guy really deserve the spot and the push he's being given? When I think people are already saying that. And I think if you're not invested in Wato already, then I think it's going to be hard to do it. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I don't think there's anyone in New Japan I'm least interested or invested in than Master Wato. And this is someone I was very high on when he left for his excursion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, I'm at the point where it's like, I'm not mapping out ways for him to come back. I'm just waiting for them to pleasantly surprise me in rectifying this this situation that they've created. Oh, and also, like, the one thing I did see is, like, for the new beginning, he's, like, in 
like a lot of the on the on the road to shows, he's like in all the main events. He is, so. yeah. <laughs> Maybe they're hoping that by doing this, anything that he learned in Mexico, which wasn't great being with the top stars in the main event, maybe he'll find his New Japan feet again. <laughs> well, man, it's definitely a great learning experience to be in the main event with those guys like Tanahashi and Ibushi and Naito, and um, I'm sure that that will be a great experience for him. And, yeah, maybe that's a thing that, that will help kind of. But, dude, we're coming up on a year of him being in main events with those guys. He was in the six-man tag tournaments with them. He, I mean, he's been tagging with all those Hontai guys for a while now. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah, I, I I don't know. It's not like, it's not like he just got here. You know right, what I mean? right. Yeah, it's almost a year. Yeah, I, I don't know what they do with Watto. <laughs> we got some uh, some qu- uh, another question from uh, Control Alt Wrist. He said Tokyo Dome is the place where top stars reach highest of highs, but before they before that they suffer a humbling defeat, like Okada at Wrestle Kingdom Nine, leading into Wrestle Kingdom Ten, or Naito from twelve to fourteen. Abushi ascended to godhood <laughs> after avenging his loss at Wrestle Kingdom 14. All the strategies, tricks, and cheating of Jay White, they weren't enough uh, against the fighting spirit of Abushi, and he was left doubting himself after this devastating loss. Assuming that Jay star- stays and this pattern continues, when will we get his crowning moment, and against who will it be as a face? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the next kind of step, I personally think the next step is for Jay to kind of come back as a baby face. Or maybe he starts as a tweener and eventually works his mm-hmm. way into a baby face. And he knows maybe it's Wrestle Kingdom um, next year, next January 2022, um, that he kind of gets in that, that big moment and gets in the main event of the Dome again. This time, no Gato by his side. Mm-hmm. He, he's fighting by his own merit. And maybe it's an Ibushi rematch and or against somebody else, I don't know, Naito, whoever, Tanahashi, whatever. And he gets that final big win by himself on his own. And that's his kind of big crowning moment. Well, you know what I was thinking when you were bringing up Osprey and yep. Jay and Will have so much. So imagine if we think Ibushi is going to get beaten by Osprey, it could be Jay versus Osprey, which is a match we've seen, but always with Jay as a heel and Will as a babyface. So maybe we'll have the roles reversed and that could be his like crowning glory. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of just speculating about Osprey winning the title so quickly. I don't know if it's re- that's really going to happen so soon, <laughs> but um, I was thinking Will would kind of make sense. I think Evil could also make sense. Um, Okada could make sense. I mean, their history is huge as well. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of guys, and I mean, who knows? It might not be, you know, this year. It might be. The year after that, I don't. I don't really know what the the full you know plan is for him going forward. He did also say, um, "Do you see any other any other guys in the roster to get this kind of delayed gratification push to the top?" Well, I mean, I think we saw, saw it with Osprey. He yeah. he <laughs> made that big loss to Okada, so I think there's going to be some delayed gratification on him to finally kind of get that big clean win, like we mentioned over Okada. I mean, the the current generation that are sort of behind the top guys. I mean. You got Osprey, you got Jay White, you got Sonata, you got Evil, and am I missing anybody else? Those are kind of like the big four guys that are on the horizon. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so all those guys will probably somehow get some kind of delayed gratification push to the top. Well, now we're going to move into talking about the New Beginning Tour. So the New Beginning Tour kicks off January 17th with the road to New Beginning, and we'll go all the way to... February 11th, um, so it's a stretch of 15 shows in 26 days. Uh, Road to New Beginning events will be January 17th, 18th, 19th, 23rd, 24th, and 25th. All those shows will be aired live with English commentary on NJPW World. Um, the, the major kind of highlight from the Road to shows will be on the January 23rd event in Tokyo, where Desperado and Kanemaru will defend the junior tag titles against Taiji Ishimori and El Fantasmo. So, are all 15 of those Road 2 shows live or no? Or going to be on New Japan World or no? Well, so all the ones in January are. So the 17th, 18th, 19th, 23rd, 24th, and 25th. All six of those shows are going to be airing live with English okay. commentary. That's a lot. 
Yeah. Yeah, especially for like a road two show, like especially for the New Beginnings one as well. Right, especially since I, mean, I didn't put the cards here because they were just so similar. There's a, there's a bunch of multi mans <laughs> setting up the the big title match feuds, and pretty much the only kind of standout thing that that was different was this junior tag title match with Suzuki Goon against Bullet Club on the twenty third. Well, um, there's some notes here that you left. In the wake of a state of emergency being declared in several Japanese uh, prefectures, New Japan Pro Wrestling events between the dates of January 17th and February 8th will take place at special earlier start times. And as circumstances continue to change and local governments adopt different approaches, further changes may be made for events other than those listed below. Uh, you know, So keep checking official news sources for the latest information. So, I mean, the... It's a lot of it's the same stuff, you know, the mask ordinances and you know, <laughs> right. And so, yeah, there's just, they wanted the shows to start earlier. So, what I heard, there's going to be starting like 6 p.m. That time, shows will be max two hours, including intermission. Some uh, we're seeing shorter cards are they're dropping out of five matches now. I think there's one card that will have six matches, but they reduce the matches, so they're trying to get people out uh, earlier here. I can appreciate that, mm-hmm. <laughs> not because I don't want to see more new japan but if it's going to be road two shows we kind of know what we're getting like you know let's bing bang boom let's get it done you know yeah so i thought we would focus our discussion here on the three big cards that will be coming up for the new beginning tour so first we have the new beginning in nagoya which will be saturday january 30th will be 4 a.m eastern time on new japan world we have the main event of the never open weight championship on the line shingo defending against tana Hiroshi tanahashi in the semi-main, we have Satoshi Kojima versus Will Ospreay. Then we have Hiroshi Tenzon versus Great Okan. Abushi Hanma, Sho, and Master Wato taking on LIJ, Sonata, Naito, Hiromu, and Bushi. And then opening the card that night will be Okada and Toriano versus Evil and Yuro Takahashi. What do you guys think about New Beginning in Nagoya? And That's quite a good show. It's a nice mix of matches. We're still doing an official preview down the road. So this, is this just a general? Uh, yeah, just a general thoughts. Yeah. Okay. But is the Kojima versus Osprey for the Rev Pro title? Is I don't think it is. No, on the oh. site it was listed as a non-title. See, if, that's what I wanted from this. <laughs> I, I wanted I, Kojima to win a title. I think the deal right now, if I recall, they're, they're having, or they might have already concluded it, but at the last tapings that, with Rev Pro, they were having a tournament to to like determine. The number one contender for the Rep Pro title, right? I think so, yeah. So I think, like, I don't think they're having any other, like, title defenses between now and then because that's, like, sort of a big deal over there or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, here we're seeing some seeds that they planted at New Year's Dash. We're seeing this Empire versus New Japan Dad feud continue. Osprey and Kojima, Tenzan and Okan. Uh, then we've got the big stare down with Shingo and Tanahashi at that main event. So we're getting this never title match here. Shingo... Against Tanahashi, that's the match I wanted for the Dome. We didn't get it, but we're getting it now. You can inject that into my veins. And uh, Tenzan and Okan, if we don't get a Mongolian chop battle, I swear yes. to God. It needs to be the shh versus uh, Okan's like, crazy Mongolian scream. Oh, you know, be- if it was a King of Pro Wrestling match, then it'd just be a Mongolian chop match. Yes. <laughs> every, every time Okan like, screams at him, I want Tenzan to fire back and go shh. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That would be awesome. So, yeah, so, solid card here. Um, you know, the semi-main and main should be really good. Yeah, Shingo Tanahashi should be, could be a match of the year contender. Oh, my God. You, you, something I need to point out. It's, like, the middle of January. We never did match of the month or wrestler of the month for uh, December. We should oh, probably uh, do that next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll get back around to that next week. <laughs> uh so then next, we have the new beginning in Hiroshima, night one, which will be Wednesday, February 10th, 4.30 a.m. Eastern time on New Japan World. We've got a main event of Hiromu defending the junior title against Sho. Semi-main, G.O.D. defending the heavyweight tag titles against Dangerous Techers. Then we'll have Ibushi and Hanma against Sonata and Naito. Okada, Yano, Goto, Ishii, and Yoshihashi versus Evil, Yujiro, Dick Togo, Taiji Ishimori, and El Fantasmo. The big Bushi versus Master Wato singles match, and then opening up with Suzuki, Despi, Kanamaru taking on Suji, Yumura, and Gabriel Kidd. Can I just point out, this is all um, Yumura's fault. He said he wanted to fight Suzuki. Here you go. There are young lions against Suzuki. Absolutely. I'm just feeling like, you know, uh, we're getting 
one really, really, really great New Beginning card spread over three nights. Uh, and I get why they're doing it for business reasons, but uh, I'm not liking it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely this probably could have been, realistically could have been one big New Beginning card. But we know we've seen this kind of pattern where they've broken these shows up to, to get more money and to kind of spread the tour out, give some guys some more time to shine. Uh, so, yeah, I, overall, I, I would have loved like, one big super card, but I understand what they're doing here. No, definitely. Like, especially with, like, having to cut the show short as well. I think it sort of is quite good that they've spread it out. But, yeah, I definitely agree. You could have it over one night, and it would be a standout card. I, um, I'm um i especially excited, though, to see Hiromu and Show. That was a mm-hmm. match that we got at the Super Juniors that I thought, like, was just outstanding. And, um, you know, I, I think there actually maybe could be a chance of upset on that night. Yeah, I mean, that would be a, a big win for Sho, getting that, that big title win over Hiromu. I believe he did pin Hiromu in the, the best of Super Juniors, which is um, which pretty much catapulted him to getting this title shot here. Um, so, yeah, this would be a huge moment for Sho. You know, a lot of people are like, you know, when is it's going to be Sho's time? When is it going to be Sho's time? Well, if they want to strike the rocket to him, this, this could be the moment. And I think now is the perfect time just because we've not got Yo, so they don't have to concentrate on the junior tag division. And yeah, I think my only issue, because I love Show Twin, but will they make Hiromu lose on his first defense? Also, we've said this about Desperado. I think they're setting up for a big Hiromu versus Despi, maybe at Dominion. Mm, yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah you could have Despi finally uh, get the belt from Hiromu. I mean, w- there's nothing that's telling us we're not going to get a Super Juniors in May like we traditionally do as well. So, I mean, that might... That might still be on the horizon also. Yeah. So then um, New Beginning in Hiroshima Night 2 is the next day, Thursday, February 11th, 1 a.m. Eastern Time, New Japan World. Uh, We've got the main event, double titles on the line, Kota Ibushi defending against Sonata. We have Taichi, Zack Sabre Jr., and Doki against G.O.D. and Jado. We have Okada and Yano versus Evil and Dick Togo. Naito, Hiromu, and Bushi versus Hanma, Sho, and Master Wato. Suzuki, Despi, and Kanamaru versus Yujiro, Taiji, and El Fantasmo. And then the opener will be the Never Six Man Champs non title match Goto, Ishii, and Yoshihashi versus Suji, Yumura, and Gabriel Kidd. And we did have a question here about the main event from Reddit user Hawaiian Punch VB. He says, With well, Sonata challenging for the IWGP heavyweight title and Chitaro Ashino challenging for the Triple Crown heavyweight title and Keiji Muto challenging for the GH- GHC heavyweight title. Is Mutoism about to take out the take over the pure pure resu landscape? Yeah, mm. absolutely. I agree there. <laughs> yeah, mu- mu- Mutoism all the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're about to see Sonata hold the IWGB title. Uh, Ashino is going to be the Triple Crown champion. And uh, how old is Kiji Muto? He's in his sixties. So he's up there. Yeah. Not, it's not 100. Yeah, Kiji Muto is going to... Out of all of those, believe it or not, I think Kiji Muto beating Go Shiozaki is the most likely <laughs> of the three matches. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I don't think Muto is a mistaken over. I, I think all three of these guys are going to do the J-O-B. Well, that wraps up New Beginning, uh, the three big shows there, Nagoya and Hiroshima Night 1 and 2. Um, in future episodes, we'll give a you know a more in depth preview and predictions for those shows as, as we get closer to those shows. Uh, real quick, we have to talk about New Japan Strong. Uh, I watched it this week. <laughs> <laughs> they had their uh, Road to Lions Break Contenders show. Uh, this is a new tour that they're on, and there's a lot of talking points uh, coming out the show. Uh, so the opener was Clark Connors defeating Kevin Knight. So we, we saw Kevin Knight debut at the Super J Cup. And so this is kind of the first singles match that we were seeing of him here. Um, just the, the new, you know, U.S. Young Lion here. Then we had Rocky Romero defeating the DKC. And uh, at post-match, DKC kind of, uh, you know, begged to be accepted into the LA Dojo and to be trained by Shibata. Shibata came out and accepted uh, DKC uh, into the LA Dojo, so kind of a big deal there for him. So I'm guessing he's he's going to become a young lion. Oh, he absolutely is. He said, you know, please bring me into the dojo. And 
Shibata came out and obliged and said, "Come with me." Yeah. So like he's absolutely in the in the dojo now. Yeah, you think he's gonna he cut cut that ponytail? What was that, Sonal? He is the New Japan father, like the New Japan LA dojo father. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, DKC. I mean, I haven't been so high in him, but like, uh, as far as the haircut, I mean, they haven't really made any of the. LA Dojo Lions cut their hair, so that's true. Yeah, know. so yeah, we'll see what happens with him. Um, then the biggest news item of the show comes from the main event. It was Team Filthy advertised as um, X Dane, Dane Limelight and um, Jr. Kratos defeat taking on the team of Brody King and Regal and the Regal Twins. And so at the beginning of the show, X was um, T. So Tom Lawler cut a promo. First of all, kicking, kicking out Russ Taylor. Tyler, Tyler Rust <laughs> as his NXT name and um, pretty much saying he, he couldn't cut the mustard and that he had somebody to replace him and his replacement was Dirty Daddy Chris Dickinson made his debut here and Team Filthy got the win and defeated Brody King and the Regal Twins with uh, Chris Dickinson getting the win there with uh, Death Valley Driver over one of the Regal Twins I couldn't believe it. Uh, I was not going to watch New Japan Strong this week, just like I don't all other weeks, because I don't <laughs> think it's a good show. But then I woke up and I saw the official Keeping It Strong style Twitter, and it was like, wait, Chris Dickinson's in New Japan? Fuck yes. I'm going to turn this shit on. And this show, top to bottom, was very good. The, the wrestling was good, as it always is, but they did all the things we've been asking them to do. Give us promos, give us angles, give us storylines, Give us surprises. They did all of those things. And I got to tell you, man, Chris Dickinson coming out with the uh, Nobuhiko Takata tribute uh, gear on, like, just fucking ruled. Like, <laughs> my, my, my favorite gear in all of wrestling is the 19, like the early 90s to mid 90s Pancre shoot style, you know, the kick pads. The short trunks and mm -hmm. you know the knee pads and all that and Dickinson's always kind of sported that look and he came out here in the purple honor you know honoring uh, Takata which w just fucking ruled um, he actually followed us this week yeah which was cool <laughs> but uh, yeah man Dickinson like he's he's like someone that I would I I always hear people be like oh I'd love to see this guy from Strong come to New Japan and I'm always like that's not happening <laughs> <laughs> none, none of those guys from California are coming but. Fuck that. Dickinson needs to be in the G1. He needs to be, he needs to be wrestling Suzuki. He needs to be wrestling in New Japan. I love Chris Dickinson. Sonal, do you have any experience uh, with Chris Dickinson? I do not. That's one of the things I really enjoyed about New Japan Strong. Like, I'm not going to lie. I am so something that I used to watch it all the time, but less now. But I do enjoy seeing new guys that maybe American fans are more aware of. So, yeah, it's nice to see new faces and, like... I'm thinking, well, why have I not been watching them? <laughs> Chris Dickinson, um, it'd be hard. I mean, he is all over the place, but at the same time, I mean, unless you're really digging into, like, Beyond Wrestling or GCW or, you know, you're, you're really deep, you know, big indies, you're not going to really be too aware of him. I think where a lot of his spotlights come from in the last few years is the Bloodsport shows, which yeah. I've attended most of those live. And, I, you know, seeing Chris Dickinson beat the brakes off of, like, uh who did he fight? He fought Butch. The Butcher, yeah. He fought Big Butch. That match was awesome. He beat up uh, Dan, Dan the Beast Severin. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, he's an incredible promo. He's got an awesome physique. He's an incredible worker. Like, I, I, I've been so high on Chris Dickinson for a while. And it's like, he's, like, the, the best blend of, like, a lot of the things that people like about, like, say, Eddie Kingston. But then you kind of mix it with, like, the Puro and the shoot style stuff. Uh, and he had that awesome match with uh, Moxley earlier this year too. Yeah, and I think his probably his biggest platform was probably Evolve. He had that long tag That's right. tag title run with, with Doom with, Patrol. Yeah, him and Jaka. Um, and so. Oh yeah, we saw we saw them drop the belts to uh, Street Profits. Street Profits. I forgot about that. Yeah. So <laughs> Dickinson, a very well traveled guy, a perfect guy for New Japan, especially in that that never division. Sign me up for Dickinson versus Shingo. <laughs> Dickinson versus Ishii. Like that would be absolutely incredible. One other thing on the show that we didn't touch on, um, Tyler Bateman. I guess they're just calling him Bateman. Bateman, now. yeah. He was on the show, and um, they kind of really kayfabe. He, so he had uh, tried out for the dojo initially. He didn't make it, and they they detailed that pretty heavily in that uh, 
California Dreamin' um, documentary, documentary that yeah. they did. Um, but he was highlighted pretty heavily in that. And then um, during during his promo, Kevin Kelly's like, well, I heard you got kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Bateman cut an awesome promo. And then one of the things he mentioned is he's like, everybody that goes through this dojo system looks, wrestles, feels, and is the same. And he's like, and they, he's like, and a guy like me, He's like they're coming out of a, a out of a you know a machine as these lambs, and he's like, and I'm I'm the big bad wolf for the slaughter. He's like, and I'm here to hurt these people. I I believe it, bro. <laughs> I was like, yes, they're getting like some really good people on this show. It's just a matter of how long are they gonna stick around. The right. awesome thing is, you were saying asking me if I knew about the other stars. Bateman is someone that I have been following for a few years and I've like had the chance to interview him and when I saw the fact that he is on New Japan I got so excited because he is right in the sense like he is nothing like any of the young lions we've ever seen absolutely yeah totally doesn't yeah fit that mold and has a, <laughs> has an interesting character I know he has an, he's in a heated feud right now in uh ring of honor he's teamed up with Vincent and they're feuding with uh Matt Taven and uh, Mike uh, Canellis or uh, uh, Bennett. Who would, have, who would have ever guessed that the way you could get Vincent over for me was putting him against Mike Canellis and uh, Matt Taven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, interesting to see what they're going to do with Bateman. And if we're going to see more Ring of Honor guys like Bateman come in, um, I know Ring of Honor has been very busy uh, re-signing people, uh, guys like Bandito, uh, Mark Haskins have all re-signed contracts. I would love to see, you know, get Bandito on strong, uh, guys like that. Um, you know, some of the foundation guys like Jonathan Gresham, Jay Lethal, uh, that they've been pushing really hard. It would be kind of cool to get some of those guys on strong. Yo, what if in a tone-deaf move, New Japan signed Marty Skrull and made him the junior for uh, the United <laughs> Empire? Uh, we, we do have a yeah, question. That would work, though. It would work. Yeah, we, we did have a question about that um, somewhere. Somebody asked, yeah, would uh, New Japan, would they kind of bring in Mari's girl? Oh, yes, they would. Um, <laughs> We're booking that now. That's been booked. But New Japan Strong was awesome this week. A lot of real, a lot of the stuff that we've been asking for, they're, they're listening and they did it. So, you know, I might check out the next week, you know. Yeah, hopefully they kind of keep going, build, building Team Filthy, um, setting up some more feuds here. And, yeah, good show this week. In the news, uh, just a couple things. Um, the big story, New Japan um, comes to Eurosport India starting January 9th. Eurosport's partnership with the 48-year-old pro wrestling franchise for 2020 and 2021 will include broadcasts of all their marquee fixtures for the New Japan calendar of the year, namely Wrestle Kingdom, New Japan Cup, Best Super Juniors, and G1 Climax. Uh, we did have a question about this from Viking Pain. Yeah, he says, New Japan just recently announced an India TV deal. So when do you guys expect to announce them to announce their U.S. and U.K. deals? I, I don't know the answer to this, but uh, if the scuttlebutt is to be believed, it sounds like the name, like whoever it is that they're signing with in the U.S. is going to be a bigger broadcaster than people maybe initially kind of expected. That's at least what we're kind of hearing. Yeah, we don't know anything in the UK. All we've got is obviously the things we saw at Wrestle Kingdom. I mean, those people have been asking me, they're like, what channel do you think? I was like, <laughs> I don't control the UK TV. I don't know. Like, it, because we obviously have like AEW and WWE on, on our televisions and stuff. But I think it's really exciting because I'll like now just hound all my friends and say, you don't want to know what I'm obsessed with. You can now watch it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing uh, I think that's noteworthy is it sound this TV deal sounds very much akin to what I've been advocating for, which is not broadcasting the U S based show that's on, you know, the website, but actually it's more similar to like what we were getting on access, which was essentially like a, a, a best of show. Right. Know? Which is what I think needs to be put on the airwaves if they're going to do this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's what it sounds like reading the press release. That yeah, this is going to be kind of a best of the, the biggest matches of the year will be broadcast on this Eurosport India show. And yeah, I'm hoping for the U.S. and U.K. deals that it does end up being something similar because like we talked about on the show that the access deal that's what got a lot of people, a lot of Westerners into New Japan because they saw they were seeing the best matches on TV it was easy for them to find uh, and that's what got them hooked well uh, that is going to do it for news we got uh, some questions to run through though this week and I actually I don't know if you know Dom Homie 101 like put in a 
some questions like eight minutes ago on the Reddit. Uh, I know. I, I just saw that notification <laughs> come through. Uh, but we might have to push those to next week. Let's uh, run through these because uh, I know um, I want to get Sonal out on a good, a good time here. He's been so so gracious to you know stay up stay up late to talk with us. Nice. So let's go through these real quick. Yeah. So first from Rambo Sam Pick, he says, "If COVID is in recession in Japan by June, what are the chances they run the Osaka Dome for Dominion? Is that why they are running Osaka Joe Hall twice for the combination of the new tour?" What do you guys think? Oh, I'm thinking that it'd be nice, but I mean, we we can't ever. Especially now, because I thought maybe like a few months ago, Japan was over the worst. Right. So I don't think there's any way of predicting literally what could happen in New Japan Cup, never mind Dominion. I think the big question there is like, are they going to be able to have an Olympics? And I think around June, that's cutting it pretty close to summertime. So, I mean, the idea that they might be running the Osaka Dome, I think something like that. I mean, that... It's, it's very interesting, you know, usually around Wrestle Kingdom time, we have announcements for some of the bigger shows that we're getting throughout the year, and they didn't do that this year. So, like, uh, if they do run a dome, I mean, I don't I, I, I don't think anything's, like, really uh, finalized the way that it typically would be this point, you know, at this time of the year. Yeah. Even, even with, you know, even if things get better by that point, I don't know. Yeah, it's so hard to, you know, count on what's going to happen in the future. So I, I could see them being hesitant to try and book something that big. And then, you know, if, if things get worse, you know, I hope they don't that, you know, they, that would kind of, you know, screw up their financials and kind of what they're planning. Staleburger bun asked, which of the following questions would you choose to never have to answer again? Who is the mole in chaos? Is Jay white leaving new Japan pro wrestling is new Japan ever going to work with AW? AKA, will the forbidden door ever be open? <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, I still want to know who the mole in chaos is. <laughs> so, cause for ages, I thought it was Chuck Taylor. <laughs> it it could have been, and maybe he, you know, the mole left. Um, yeah, these these are all questions that you know we've been asked frequently. Also, the Jay White one is pretty new. Uh, the AW one I get asked so much, and I'm just like, like I say my answer, and they just keep asking. But come on, and I'm just like, if it happens, it happens. I think like I don't know, uh, our audience just doesn't ask us that question very often anymore because like, I, I think I'm too mean in the way I answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I'm 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 fine with answering whatever questions they want to ask us. You know what questions I don't like? I don't like when they're like. This time next year at Wrestle Kingdom, who do you see being in the main event and who's going to win the G1 in between now and then? Like, <laughs> There's no way of knowing that. <laughs> uh, next question from EM Data's PR. He says, do you expect to see Shooter back in New Japan later this year or has COVID paused his development? I think it's COVID's paused because I know I was so excited when Shota came to the UK because like, I'm going to go and see him and I'm going to see him wrestle. And I... Like, unlike we know Narita's obviously doing stuff in the LA Dojo, I don't know what Shota's doing. I don't even know, is he in the UK? Is he in Japan? So I feel like they're not going to bring him back without at least some development in another place. I have no idea where he is, what he's doing. Um, but I mean, do hashtag where's Shota? Yes. <laughs> but I mean, I think I think it pretty much pauses the development of everybody that's abroad. You know, Ren Narita, Shota Mino, you know. So, uh, yeah, I mean... Probably even uh, your, your boy, what's his name, uh, Hikaleo, too. So Right. Because even, even though Narita is in the L.A. Dojo, part of being in the States was him working independent shows um, in that in that California area. And even he was supposed to be, I think he was going to do the, the Ring of Honor Pure uh, tournament as well. Um, so, you know, getting him some, you know, American experience outside of the dojo in New Japan was going to be a big part of the excursion. Uh, he's still going to get some good stuff with Strong and working with some of those indie guys on Strong. But, yeah, with Shooter, I, I hope we see him back soon. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of good reports on his excursion from um, from the matches that he was having in Rev Pro. And so, yeah, hopefully he can make a big impact when he comes back. Viking Pain asked us, even with all the baggage and the heat that may come from it, if you were New Japan, would you bring in the recently released Marty Skrull? Mm -hmm. Uh, I can tell you right now, I know for a fact that New Japan would bring in Marty Skrull. 
they don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah, no, I was gonna say the same thing. <laughs> they, they don't care. I mean, and and this is not this is not me putting a stamp of approval one way or the other. We've de- you know we've discussed the uh, um, speaking Osprey. out stuff you know mm-hmm. in heavy detail, but at the end of the day, Marty Scurll never committed an actual crime. And I'm not saying that doesn't make it right one way or the other, but I'm just saying in the eyes of management at New Japan Pro Wrestling, with a guy that has a proven track record of drawing in a junior division where they have no stars, and I mean, he is a drawing star f- for the company. Yes, one, they like him. They've always liked him. They would 100% hire him for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I could easily see them... Not, not, they might not even know what has happened really with him here. Um, I'm sure they know. Um, and so I could easily see them bringing him, him in, like some, like we mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, his background could fit in well with the Empire, and we know his history with Osprey. So every every single time that they have ever responded to something that's happened domestically with one of their stars, it's not because they care necessarily. It's because of the public outcry, you know, right. That's why they, that's why, you know, they responded so poorly when Tai Chi was having an affair or like when, uh, Takamichinoku was having an affair, things like that. But like when it's a foreigner, it's not seen the same way because they, it's something that's happening abroad. Many of the fans aren't even really aware of it. So it's like, it doesn't really affect their bottom line. I mean, they definitely know about what's going on. Remember, they never brought Elgin to for, for like any of the U.S. Any, tours. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're not going to be like bringing Marty Scroll for like say, strong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I bet you they would bring him over, and I bet you they'd use him, and they'd probably build him up. Yeah. Uh, so his other question is: he said, I thought the Thunder Sticks use at Wrestle Kingdom 15 was a brilliant idea. Do you guys think the audience will continue to get used to them? New Japan could make a nice amount of money too by making wrestler centric Thunder Sticks like an Ibushi branded one or LIJ one. Sana, what did you think about the use of the Thunder Sticks? So, which were they again? They were the. So, like. The, like they were kind of like the things where you would hear like the. Um, I didn't even know they were using those. I, yeah. So, I didn't hear them because I know when they first announced it last year, I actually got it and started using it while I was watching the show. But I didn't actually hear it at Wrestle Kingdom. I, I think so. I think the, that's why I got a bit confused because I didn't hear any of it. I never heard these. I think my idea of allowing the fans to pre-record their messages and then and then hit a button and then they shout them out that would be better. Well, I mean, they, they tried the, an app kind of <laughs> crowd reaction thing. That was a different idea. <laughs> that that was a bastardization of my idea. My idea would be like. <laughs> You speak in your phone and, you, and like ahead of time, you you pre-record like six or seven messages, and then you hit it and you'd be like, "You suck, Osprey," <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff like yeah. that. But yeah, the Thunder Six, I did I did hear them at Wrestle Kingdom fifteen, um, and I thought they were a good kind of addition to, along with the clapping. And so yeah, I think yeah, monetize it. Yeah, get a Golden Star you know version of Abushi's logo all over it. I think it'd be great for them to. Keep using it and then also brand them. Yeah, you can definitely make money off those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, next question uh, here from Kevin from DC. He says, a quick theory about King of Pro Wrestling. The Rambo featured every superstar on the roster, not featured in a match, including the likes of Ishii, Goto, Suzuki, Nagata. Four names still held in high regard. However, the brass went with a bo- with Bushi, Chase Owens, and Bad Luck Fale to challenge Yano for the inaugural dot, dot, dot. Sorry, I mean provisional 2021 champion. That's right. <laughs> If you ask me, I think the reason why they went this avenue is to give Bushi and Owens their first single entrances down the Tokyo Dome ramp. It's probably something that won't happen again under normal circumstances. So if you ask me, it came off as a thank you for your service moment more than anything else. Any thoughts? I don't think that was it. I think they're not going to have Yano beat like Suzuki, Goto, and Ishii, are they? I mean, like, right. They're not going to have him beat. I mean, they, obviously he has in the past, but I feel like they were going a certain way with that title. And they did it perfectly. I agree with you, but I'm also kind of like, they had him beat Okada for the belt. That was a classic. I think it just has to do with, with the slotting of KOPW. They, they made it very clear that KOPW is going to be kind of a comedy opening card thing. So you're not going to put your upper mid card guys like Ishii, um, Suzuki, and Goto in there. You're going to put your opening card comedy guys, Bushi, Owens, and Fale in there. 
I mean, I think he kind of has a point. Like, yeah, those guys got to, you know, walk out in the Tokyo Dome, which is kind of a cool thing. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's the KOPW title. Like, I don't know why we're talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, next question, um, he said, there are many amazing spots and moments from all the matches over the last two days, but the major spot that stood out to me was during the never open weight title match when Shingo, Takagi, and Jeff Cobb, there's a notable spot in the match where the two wrestlers are fighting outside and Cobb whips Shingo into the barricade. Impressively, Shingo nearly no sells it, runs back to Cobb and finds himself thrown via the most impressive overhead belly to belly suplex I've seen in some time. That was the spot of the night for me off the top of my head. Did something else stand out to you as spot of either night? Oh, I have one. And maybe it's not others, but just because you hardly ever see it. It was Okada going through the ropes with the toe pick on Hilo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> Cause, uh, and Shingo did one as well. And I was thinking, you don't see it from those two that often. I can't believe... No one has mentioned uh, Dick Togo and the bump he took through the oh table. Oh my, dude! I love the bump that so Togo took through. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe it might not be as as impressive as Shingo's belly to belly or Topic con Hilo, but Kota Ibushi doing a reverse Kamagoye. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I love that. Um, I mean, ELP did that like rope walk. Into uh, an acai moonsault. Mm, yeah, that was dope. You know what I like with ELP when he used Hiromu as like a stepping, like as a, like a stool. Mm, yeah. And then did his flip. That was cool. There was a lot of cool stuff. Um, last couple questions here. Maple Leaf Wrestling History Podcast asked, "Are you guys aware of the upcoming schedule of New Japan? I was wondering if either of you would be interested in reviewing older events or creating some sort of classic match playlists." During the off weeks, and I, I don't think we're getting any off weeks. Yeah, we, we got a stacked uh, new beginning tour here, and if things go the way that they're going, uh, I think we're going to get normal. We got, we got Road to Castle Attack in later in February, <laughs> and, and, and the big Castle Attack show in Osaka Joe Hall at the end of February. So I think, we're, we're you know, as long as things are somewhat manageable, we're going to get a full year schedule of New Japan here. Listen, if if more of you would give money to this podcast <laughs> <laughs> you know so i could quit my job we can make time for, we, we could do any number of historic review shows and i mean i would i could dig into that all day we could we could produce those <laughs> we can make this happen you know subscribe to our what, what how do they give us money i don't even know uh, they can go to social suplex.com <laughs> slash donate and yeah you donate to the podcast <laughs> you buy our shirts <laughs> um but other than that like i don't know um, the, the reality is like new Japan never stops when we, when we started this podcast three years ago, we, we literally were like, I don't know if we're going to have content some weeks, what are we going to do? And like, it just never stops. Yeah. And we've got busy schedules. I mean, Josh is training to be a wrestler and we're both working. So <laughs> Sana with, with, with everything that you do, I mean, it, it's primarily this pretty much the same. I mean, you're not really delving into classic stuff or anything like that. Right. No, but <clears throat> someone did actually ask me to do a video looking at the top five matches for new New Japan fans. But no, exactly. Like I had these list of ideas for like looking at old matches and stuff. But with the schedule, it just feels like I've basically got to just look at tours and like reviewing them, previewing them, and things like that. Yep. So, I mean, I'd love to. Like, <laughs> like you said, if um. If people want to pay me to do this full time, because <laughs> at the moment it's great. I'm furloughed, so I'm at home. I can watch stuff, but there'll come a time where I won't have time to do it all. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only hope for us doing classic content this year is if there's another shutdown and we have to go back to our uh, our, concept our concept shows, yeah. which were awesome, yeah, which I loved. But then, you know, we came back and so we can't do that anymore. <laughs> Uh, his last question, he asked, does Jeff Cobb have a glass nose? I guess he's asking because his nose got busted open. I don't really. During a Shingo match. I feel like there's been a couple of matches in New Japan where his nose gets busted open. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last question we're leaving this off on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then I guess my answer. Well, so actually, one funny thing. I remember tweeting. This is when Cobb was a baby face. And for some reason, I was like, it was a weird day. And I was like, I wonder if Jeff Cobb is a good hugger. And I got a reply from TJ Perkins and Carl Frederick. 
yes, he is a good hugger, apparently. <laughs> so I don't know if he's got a glass nose, but he's a good hugger, apparently. Well, with his belly to belly suplex, uh, I'm sure he, he has a great grip for hugs. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that wraps up the questions. Uh, last thing here is the recommended match of the week. So last week we did not give a recommended match just because there was two nights at Wrestle Kingdom. There was New Year's Dash. Uh, we wanted to make sure everybody was getting that watched. Um, but now you know we're back on to our regular schedule here. So uh, Sonal, you're, it's on you this week. You're gonna give our listeners the the recommended match they should watch this week. All right, so it was actually because I did another podcast where I was looking at it, and it was it's actually Okada versus Marafuji. Oh yes, <laughs> which one? I I watched that for the first time like a few weeks ago, and oh my god, that is a ma- if you don't watch any New Japan matches, go and watch that one. Is it the KO, Is it the King of Pro Wrestling match or the yeah. G One match? Yeah, the King of Pro Wrestling one. Okay, awesome. They're both really good. Yeah, both of them are great, but yeah. Just because that's when I watch most recently. Nice. That sounds. I'm down for that. Have, that. I don't think you've seen that, right? I, I don't think I have seen that one. So yeah. So Okada, Marifuji, King of Pro Wrestling. Uh, check that out on NJPW World. That's the recommended match of the week. Next week we'll come back and we'll give our uh, thoughts and recaps on that match. Uh, so I know we want to thank you so much for being on the show with us. Uh, go ahead and tell our listeners uh, where they can find you online. Get all your plugs in and uh, let them know all stuff that you're working on. So you can find me on Twitter at wrestling underscore chat. I tweet very random things. Um, my YouTube channel's life, and you can find me on Wrestle Talk. So I post New Japan articles, hoping to broaden um, my stuff there to get more New Japan content. So yeah, YouTube and Twitter are my two main places. You broke up a little bit there when you were dropping your Twitter and YouTube. Say those uh, one more time. <laughs> So my Twitter is at wrestling underscore chat and my YouTube is Sonal's Life. So if you just type any of those, they should come up. Awesome. So yeah, go ahead, give her a follow, subscribe. Uh, puts out some great uh, YouTube videos there. You can also find them uh, in the New Japan Reddit. Uh, so yeah, we want to thank you so much once again for uh, joining us this week. And thank you for so much for having me. I love coming on and th- talking to people about New Japan because I feel like in my real life, I don't have anyone to talk to, so <laughs> it's always great to talk to people who appreciate good wrestling. Yeah, and it was great talking to you as well. And yeah, we'll keep the conversation going on on Twitter and on Reddit, and yeah, just keep promoting this thing that we love. Honestly, I've, my dream is for one day for New Japan to take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's going to wrap things up for this week. Next week, we'll be back to review uh, the beginning of the Road to New Beginning tour. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider making a donation by visiting socialsuplex.com slash donate. Click on the donate button under the Keeping a Strong Style logo. Make sure you connect with us on social media. On Twitter, the show is at KI Strong Style. The network is at Social Suplex. You can follow me at Jeremy L. Donovan. On Facebook, we are facebook.com slash social suplex. You can join us in the Facebook group, uh, Wrestling Squared Circle, facebook.com slash group slash Wrestling Squared Circle. On Instagram, we are at social suplex. You can email me, Jeremy, at social suplex.com. On Reddit, I'm the pro black guy. Josh is keeping his strong style. And check out all the other shows that we have here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We have One Nation Radio, hosted by Rich Latta and James Boyd, the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show from Scotland. On Thursdays, we have the Grave Consequences with Caleb and Maserati. On Fridays, we have the 8-Bit Suplex with Josh, Number 2, and Sandy. Saturdays, we have All Things Elite with Floyd and Austin. And we also have the Great Match Generator with Danny and Beast Mike. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review. And we will catch you next week on Keeping It Strong Style, the ace of podcasts. Jay White's not leaving. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Keeping It Strong Style. We'll see you next time.